Hello friends. This is Muse Fanfiction. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto had Chimera and genetically manipulated every bloodline in existence? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. It had been a few days since the Kyubi no Kitsune had attacked Kanahagakur no Sato. The Kyubi had been sealed into a baby less than a few minutes old. This baby was a boy with shimmering blue eyes. Right now, he was on the council table surrounded by the Hokage, his three advisors, the representative of the three Sanin and the Shinobi Council. As he squirmed around, these groups of people looked at him with sadness, anger, and fear. The Sandame Hokage, Hirazan Serutobi sighed as he stood up. He looked around to see who was here. He said, Hello everyone. I wish we were meeting on better terms, but it is good to see that you all are here. For that I am grateful. It is unfortunate that the Yandaimi Hokage has passed on to the other side. As a result of the Yandaimi not choosing a successor, I have been reinstated as the Hokage. Now Shikaku, report the damages that we know of so far. Shikaku had two scars on the right side of his face. He had dark hair tied up into a spiky ponytail, dark eyes as well as a goatee. He wore a meshed shirt underneath his flak jacket, a deerskin coat over that and hand guards. He was the Jonin commander and the main representative for the ninja council. He sighed as he spoke, Hokage-sama, we lost more than one-third of our ninja populace. The north sector was completely wiped out. This included our premier Jonans, the Yumino family and Yuji family. The Yumino's son Aruka was able to escape with minor injuries. The Yuji's daughter was on the south side of the war and only suffered minor injuries. The south side lost about half of their forces including the Midarashis. Kurunai Yuji was able to save a one, Enko Midarashi from the battle. The west sector was evacuated safely with only one injury to a Kazashi Haruno the husband to deputy Anbu commander Saya Haruno. The east sector was not hit. So, no injuries to report on the east sector. We are still receiving reports on the injured and MIA. It does not look good Hokage-sama. Hiruzen just sighed. His mind started to move a mile a minute as he thought about the aftermath of this horrible event. He said, we are at our most vulnerable. I have always been against quantity over quality ideal. However, because we have lost so many and will not be able to populate quick enough, we are going to change the Shinobi Academy. We will curve the classes making it so you can pass the Genin test by being able to use the Bunshin, Henge, and Kawerimi. In addition, we will administer a new test for Jonin effective immediately. Okay, Fugaku what is the status of the police? Fugaku had short, black hair and onyx eyes with visible creases below them. He wore the standard flak jacket, along with a black shirt with the Konoha military police force symbol on the shoulders, shin guards and a black apron with white diamonds on the bottom. He was the second Jonin commander. He said, we lost about half of the police force. We should be able to get the exact amount tomorrow. We can bring it back to 85% if we call back many of the Anbu members. Hiruzen stroke his beard at this. He thought about it but dismissed it almost as soon as it came to mind. We are not recalling those Anbu members. I thought about what we are going to do. Hiyashi, since half of the branch members are not ninjas, but are trained in ninjutsu, we are going to add them to the police force. Your brother, Hazashi, will be the other commander. Hokage-sama, you can't do that. We were promised this by your sensei. Are you going to effectively change the rules your sensei set in front of all these people? Fugaku exclaimed. The history of the police derives from the Nadaim. The Nadaim promised the Uchihas to have control over the police with certain rules applied. Before Hiruzen could speak, Hiyashi started to speak. He had long dark brown hair and featureless white eyes like all members of his clan. He wore a very traditional, loose-fitting robes. He had a tattoo of the Hyuga clan symbol on his wrist. He was the clan head of the Hyuga family and the third Jonin commander. He said in his stoic voice, Fugaku-san, this is not about tradition. We need to come together as a nation. You know that if we are able to work together. Hiyashi-san, don't try to pull that patriotism crap. I know that you have ulterior motives that would bring your clan closer to the rank of Hokage. Fugaku seethed. 
Who does he think he is fooling? Fugaku thought as he felt his power starting to wane. Hiruzen rubbed his temples as his could become a bad decision in the future. He said, Fugaku and Hiyashi, we will discuss this later. There is a reason I called all of you here. The council started to murmur amongst themselves. Serutobi continued, Yes, there is a reason you all are here today. This discussion is about the baby in front of you. As if on cue, the young baby snored softly as he snuggled deeper into the blanket. Most of the leaders were swooned at how adorable he was. Soom said, Hokage-sama, who is this little pup? Soom had an animalistic look to her. She had long spiky brown hair, vertical slit-like pupils, elongated canine teeth and nails. She also had the clan fang markings on her cheeks as well as markings over her eyes and a dark shade of purple lipstick. She wore the standard outfit of a Konoha shinobi. She had to admit he was cute as he rocked himself from side to side. Fugaku grunted in agreement. Hokage-sama, who is this brat? Didn't we decide that all orphans are to be placed into orphanages? Hiyashi, although he didn't want to say it, agreed with Fugaku. The brat, although cute, was just a baby. What was so special about him that he was here? He activated his Byakugan silently to see the boy's chakra. He quickly shut the Byakugan off as the boy's chakra was so dense. The Hayuga leader clutched his eyes. Everyone including the giggling baby looked at the Hayuga leader with interest. The Sandame Hokage voiced his concern, Hiyashi-san, are you okay? Hiyashi nodded his head saying he's fine. The Hokage, of course, didn't believe him but let it go for now. Naruto turned over to look at the Hokage in the face. He gave the older man a foxy smile. The Sandame Hokage had a pain-filled smile as he started to explain who this boy was. He said, well, everyone, this boy is our savior. His name is Naruto. Minato was not able to kill the Kyubi no Kitsune. There is no conceivable way to kill a massive unit of dark and evil chakra. He let them all digest it before he continued, because of this, he, Jiraiya, Orochimaru, and I came to a consensus. We could not possibly kill the beast but must keep it at bay. The only way we can keep something like that ferocious beast at bay is by sealing it. Gasps were heard as they realized that the Kyubi was in fact not dead. Hiruzen took a long puff of his pipe. He said, to be able to seal a tailed beast, one must have his chakra coils not developed. In addition, one or more people must sacrifice his, her, or their lives for the sacrifice to the Shinigami. This process is extremely taxing on not only the sealer but the baby. The baby has the distinct possibility to break down because of the energy of another being. He or she could die and release the beast. Inoichi had a long ponytail darker in shade of blonde. He also had dark blue eyes. Inoichi wore the standard flak jacket over a black outfit, complete with hand guards, forehead protector and a sleeveless red coat. He was the Yamanaka clan leader. He said, there is also the possibility that the brain could break down. Hokage sighed as he said, yes that is a possibility. Minato decided that because he could not kill the beast, he will seal it into a baby. Hiruzen paused as this digested into everyone's mind. Shibi stroke his dark chin. Shibi Abarame had his eyes obscured. He wore dark glasses with a tassel hanging down from them. He had very spiky short black hair and a mustache. He wore a high-collared outfit and carries a large gourd on his back. He was the leader of the Abarame clan. He said, with an educated guess this young one is the one with the Kayubi inside him. I wonder why him. Why could it not have been an Abarame, Uchiha, Hayuga or any of the major clans? Who were his parents? Orochimaru had to agree. Orochimaru was a very pale-skinned man waist-length black hair. He had amber eyes with slits in his pupils and purple markings around his eyes. His garbs included black pants and a thick purple rope belt tied in a large knot behind his back and blue tomo-shaped earrings. He wore a black polo neck under it. Hames Serutobi Sensei. I must admit you have me intrigued. He will be a perfect specimen for my experiments. So, Naruto-kun, who are your parents? The Hokage sighed. He said, this is an S-class secret. The protocol for S-class secret is treason and you will be killed with no hesitation. Everyone knew that this was a serious thing. Orochimaru was basically grinning as Naruto's parents must be very important. The Hokage took extra precautions. 
He closed all the blinds in the meeting rooms and put a sound barrier up so no one could hear a peep. As the edge was set by the Hokage, everyone in the meeting was waiting to hear who this young child's parents are. The young boy squirmed as he felt the gaze of everyone around him. It was more of a confused gaze but a gaze, nonetheless. The Hokage took a deep breath as he said with a heavy heart, Naruto-kun's parents are Minato Namikaze and Kashina Uzumaki. His godfather is Jiraiya. The shinobi council's eyes were wide. Naruto started to cry as he could feel that they were talking about his parents. It hurt a few of their hearts seeing baby Naruto crying for his parents. However, Orochimaru was not having such problems. Oh my Naruto-kun, you are indeed the best person for the job. Who would have thought that the Hokage could hide a child in plain sight? Jiraiya seems to have been keeping secrets from me. Oh well, Jiraiya does not matter but this child. If I'm right, then Naruto you will be the perfect host for what is coming soon. The one who had been extremely quiet was Choza. Choza had long red hair and had markings on his cheeks. He wore a samurai-like outfit which entails a black suit completed with armor that had the clan symbol, food, on it. He also wore a rope belt, hand guards, and instead of a forehead protector, wore a piece of cloth tied to his head, possibly to hold back his hair. He said, Hokage-sama, you can't be serious. He is the son of the strongest Hokage to ever exist and the strongest Anbu member in the Crimson Red Death. How could we not have known? The Hokage's gaze was fixated on the red-headed man. He said, Choza, I take high offense to that statement. You never talk about another leader like that in front of the current leader. However, since that is not as important as this situation, I will let it slide. Don't let it happen again. Seeing Choza gulp, Hiruzen continued, Orochimaru, have you had any contact with Jiraiya on his mission? Orochimaru stood up and said, Serutobi-sensei, he has contacted me, but we had no such luck. He has reached Taki and will be on his way to Kiba no Kuni in a few days. He will be back within the month. Hiruzen nodded at this, Damn it Tsunade, why aren't you here? We need you now more than ever. He said, Unfortunately Naruto-kun's godfather is not around as he is on his mission. Now the question is where should we put him? I'm open to ideas. Murmuring filled the room. Each clan had something to gain from having Naruto in their clan. Hiyashi knew this opportunity would put the Hayugas over their dojutsu rivals, the Uchihas. Sum Inazuka saw this as a possibility to get a powerful animal ally. Shikaku really didn't want him for personal gain other than understanding what possessing the Kyubi can do. Inoichi was the same way as Shikaku. However, he wanted to study the mind of the boy who had the Kyubi. Choza wanted to see how the boy's body would be affected by the Kyubi. Fugaku jumped first. Hokage-sama, the Uchiha clan would be honored to have Naruto in our ranks. Shikaku saw some deceit in Fugaku's jet black eyes. He reacted quickly and said, Hokage-sama, it would be a disservice to the village. For the Uchiha to get Naruto would prove deadly to the village. Fugaku narrowed his eyes to the Nara leader. Orochimaru saw his once-in-a-lifetime opportunity in his grasp. He stood up and said, Serutobi-sensei, it would not be wise to give the boy to any clans. Each clan would have a distinct advantage over the other clans. Serutobi stroked his beard as the other clans were not exactly happy. Soon growled at Orochimaru for the insinuation that her clan would use Naruto as an advantage. Many of the other clans were thinking the same thing but were silent. Serutobi said, Orochimaru, what do you suggest? It is very unlike you to start talking without having a suggestion. Orochimaru grinned at this possibility. Sometimes it was good to have the leader of the village as your sensei. Serutobi sensei, it seems you know me very well. Yes, I do have a suggestion. As I said, each clan would have advantage over the other clans. So, what if we do not give him to a clan but to a person who is not of any clan? Someone like me. Gasps were heard after this. It was not normal for someone like Orochimaru, the hubby Sanim, to adopt a child. Hiyashi narrowed his eyes at the hubby Sanim. He did not like that Orochimaru had been dismissing the clan so easily. Hiyashi was not stupid by any means. This was the Hyuga's opportunity and he would be damned if he didn't go down fighting for it. He said, Orochimaru-san, 
what makes you qualified to be the foster parent for young Naruto-kun? You have around the same amount of bounty on your head as Minato-sama. Could you be able to protect him if some should arise? At least I know that if something happened, we would not only have the main but the branch there to protect him. Quote. Orochimaru frowned slightly, he knew the politics of Konoha. It would always be an uphill battle for people of non-clans to get something done. However, he had a few snakes in the hole. He said in his calmest voice, Hiyashi-sama, it is true that I have a bounty over my head that could build four Uchiha districts. However, that does not mean I do not qualify. When I am on a mission my snake summons are adept enough to take care of him. In addition, six days ago, I was the fourth best Fuinjutsu user in Konoha. The only ones who were higher were Kashina, Minato, and Jiraiya respectfully. Now I'm the best in Konoha right now. I can break down complex seals that would take you all a lifetime to learn and understand. Naruto-kun's seal is one of the most complex seals to exist as it deals with the death god, Shinigami. With a small mistake it is certain that you could lose your own lives and destroy your clan. I am slightly offended to be honest. What you have done disputing the care of a baby who has the potential to be great is appalling. Soon sama it is like me arguing with you over an extremely rare white Cerberus. What would I be able to say, even though you and your clan are the animal trainers who specialize in dogs, I'm more qualified because it's an animal. To be quite honest, that would be asinine and insane of me to do that to Sum Sama. So please explain to me why would you even consider doing that to me? Yet, there is something that's been constantly tugging at my brain and that is the Uchihas. We've read the fairy tale about the Valley of the End, how Madara Uchiha summoned the Kayubi and Hashirama defeated it. It occurred to me that Fugaku over here was the first to try and put Naruto into, ranks. It makes me wonder how much of that story is true. Ladies and gentlemen, there it is on the table. The Uchiha would put him in one of their ranks not even in the family but a rank. It occurred to me and possibly all of you that when you pull ranks, you are merely a tool to that person. Perhaps even a means to reach the other, tool. I have no such need for that. Not to sound why but I am one of the more powerful shinobi around. Imagine if something went wrong. How many of you can legitimately go toe to toe with a pissed off Jiraiya? You have never seen Jiraiya pissed but I have. I wouldn't say it publicly but if Jiraiya was serious in a fight half of Konoha would be destroyed. He would wipe a whole clan right out. So, unless you can handle that man with a sweat beating down your face, I would suggest that you allow me to have and train Naruto. Fugaku was visibly shaken, it was not from fear of Jiraiya. No, it was something deeper. It was anger. This anger had awakened the Sharingan unconsciously from the brute man. H how dare he, I will kill you nice and slow. If you get the boy, I'll make sure your life will be without a doubt deadly. I will make you suffer. Sum on the other hand was angry but understood. Damn you, Orochimaru, I hate to admit it, but you were right. It doesn't matter Naruto-kun. I'll make sure that the Inazukas respect you and you will be considered one of our own. Serutobi was surprised that Danzo didn't say anything. He actually wanted Danzo to speak up as it would give him a great and legitimate reason as to investigate the man's side projects. He did have to admit that Orochimaru's points were valid. However once Jiraiya comes back he along with Tsunade would take care of the boy. Hiruzen took a puff of his pipe. He didn't see any objections as to Orochimaru's plan. He said, well counsel due to the fact there are no objections to Orochimaru's proposal, I have decided that Naruto will be going to Orochimaru. There will be a meeting in three days. This meeting has been adjourned. Orochimaru, I want you to stay behind. After the meeting was dismissed, Danzo reached the root hideout. Danzo was an old frail man with a cane. He had black shaggy hair, and his right eye is kept bandaged. Danzo had had an X-shaped scar on his chin. He wore a white shirt, with a brown robe over top of it covering from his feet, to just over his right shoulder. He sat down as his mind was processing everything that occurred. In a blink of a second, three root Anbu ninjas dropped in front of the root leader. Tishio Namikuso was a muscular shinobi with pale skin. He said, Danzo-sama, may I ask a question? Normally, Danzo would say no, but he had a feeling this question pertained to the young boy. He tapped his scarred chin and said, Go on Tishio-kun. Danzo-sama, why did you not try to retain the boy? 
Would it not be beneficial for the organization? He would easily rise in our ranks especially if we trained him at this age. Danzo nodded in agreement with Tishio. However, there was a look in Danzo's eyes signifying something darker. He tapped his cane causing five more root ninjas to appear in front of him. He closed his eyes as he spoke softly, you are correct Tishio kun However, that is why I did not put my cards in the pile. Tishio was naturally confused about this. He voiced his confusion, Danzo Sama that does not make much sense. This was an opportunity to become the greatest hero in Konoha's lustrous history of heroes. Danzo was eerily quiet, he had always been calm but this had a different feel to it and Tishio knew it. He started to shake in the inside. It took Danzo a few moments to speak. You're right, Tishio, I would be. However, that is what Serutobi wanted me to do. If I put my cards on the line and try to get this supposed lottery pick, it would give Hiruzen a way to investigate the root organization. It does not help that the boy is Jiraiya's godson. That changed everything. It is almost too good to be true. Quote. That makes a lot of sense, Danzo Sama. It finally CED for Tishio. Unfortunately for Tishio, it did not see quickly enough. Danzo looked at him deep into his eyes. In an eerily calm voice, Danzo said, Hiraku, terminate Tishio. Before Tishio could move, Hiraku slit Tishio's neck with no hesitation. Danzo said, Hire, clean Tishio up off the floor and dispose of the body properly. I need everyone to leave the proximity. Fukusho, I need to speak with you at once. In an instant the five root members along with Kiraku and Kire, who was carrying Tishio's body, disappeared in a swirl of leaves. A blurry being had kneeled in front of the root leader. Danzo said, Fukusho, I have a new project for you. I want to gather ten groups each having a censor and a man and woman who could pass off as civilians. Fukusho bowed his head and nodded. Danzo Sama, what is your mission and when do you want it completed? Danzo simply tapped his chin. Lately our program has become lax. It seems that my ninjas have been questioning my authority. The emotion test seems to be incomplete. We are going to start from scratch and rebuild. The Kyubi attack might be a blessing in disguise for the organization. We have an abundant number of orphans that neither the orphanage nor the foster care system can take complete care of. Your mission is to abduct deserving orphans pertaining to training. This will be known as Operation Adopt. Your mission is to make the male and female to pose as civilians to adopt orphans and bring them here. Your sensors will first see if the orphan is worth the trouble. He will see if the children have regular chakra streams. If the chakra is over 0.005% and are infants those are the ones we want. If they are older the sensors will know which kid is able to be an asset for the organization. Fukusho asked, Danzo-sama, how about the ones with Keke Jenkes? Danzo smirked. Good for us, it has been almost two years since the council meeting. Orochimaru had injected a variety of different pathogens inside Naruto. Although Naruto had grown drastically, his change was nowhere near close to the change that had been going on with Orochimaru. Yes, the hubby Sanin had grown to like having the boy around. Orochimaru was a scientist that does everything with no regrets. Yet, during the last few months when he injected the Keke Jenkes into the boy, he felt a twinge of sadness and guilt go through him. He shook it off, but it was still there. Today Orochimaru was getting ready for Naruto's second birthday, which is about a week from now and Orochimaru was going to make the birthday a great one. Naruto had been invited to a lot of the shinobi clan heir's birthday parties. They were more of a get-together for the parents that just so happened to land on the child's birthday. Hum what kind of party should I throw for you Naruto-kun? Maybe I should bring him out and let's see which toys one he reacted better to. Orochimaru thought. He pulled up his sleeve and nicked his thumb. He swiped the blood over the symbol. The symbol started to glow as he put chakra onto the seal. Kuchio's no jutsu, he exclaimed. Suddenly seals started to go across the floor. Naruto started to squeal happily as he knew what was about to happen. Soon a small puff of smoke had appeared. When the smoke disappeared, a three feet tall orange snake appeared. Naruto giggled and laughed as he saw the snake. He squealed with his tiny voice, Hubby Chan. Yes, Naruto was talking. He started about five months ago. 
It was a day Orochimaru never could forget because Naruto called him to San. Oh, how Orochi hated that he started to warm up to the boy. Naruto squeezed the poor snake half to death. Orochimaru chuckled at the poor orange snake's plight. He said, Naru kun, let Orenji go. Naruto with confused look on his face, let go of the snake. Orenji crawled his way to the snake summoner. He had the man's sandal saying thank you repeatedly. Orochi pet the top of the snake's head. He said, Orenji, do you mind growing to about five feet tall? I want to take Naruto out to pick up stuff for the party. Orenji nodded and grew until he was six feet tall. Orenji said, Orochimaru-sama, it has occurred to us that you are starting to grow more attached to the boy. We wonder how he plays into your plans. We personally like the boy. Are you going to allow him to summon us when he becomes of age? Orochimaru's eyes went wide. He told Orenji to follow him into the other room as he summoned a shadow clone to watch the boy. When he saw that Naruto was nowhere in sight, he sighed as he said, Orenji-kun, Naruto-kun will more than likely not be alive when he reaches the age of 13. Orenji's eyes went wide. What was wrong with Naruto-sama? Orochimaru-sama, what is wrong with Naruto-sama? Does he have a terminal illness or something? If we could see what the problem is, we could try and fix it. So, what are we doing here? Why? Orochimaru sighed, no Orenji-kun. When the time is right, I am going to transfer bodies with Naruto. He stammered at the beginning. Orenji's eyes went wide, his eyes then narrowed as he looked at the hubby Sanim. His face showed the utter disgust in the hubby Sanim. His tail switched from side to side angrily. You are going to use that technique on him. W hat the hell are you thinking? If you are going to do that why are you getting so attached to him? Why would you allow us to get attached to the boy? Orochimaru just sighed. He said, Orenji, I don't want to talk about it right now. Right now, my priorities are on the party and making sure everything is right with Naruto. Orenji hissed at this under his breath. He was going to talk to the other leader of the snake clan. He slithered his way to the young boy that he has watched since the boy was young. Orochimaru got a chair and sat down. Oh Naru-kun, how I loathe that warming personality of yours that can make a person who has done so many experiments on kids like you, feel regret. All I was supposed to do was make sure your body was healthy and not get attached. Why was the latter harder than the former? Well I guess it is time to go arrange. Orochimaru's thoughts were stopped as a visitor decided to show up. Orochi's slit eyes looked dangerously into the man's eyes. I told him not to come here during the day. What is it that he wants that he would come during the day? I'm going to send my shadow clone to send Naruto out and about while I deal with him. Orochimaru sent the message to his shadow clone as he looked at the man once more. Orochimaru said in his sarcastic tone, Well, look who decided to show up in someone's house in the daytime for the first time in over 20 years. Isn't that right? Danzo. Meanwhile Orochimaru's shadow clone was walking with baby Naruto and Orenji outside in Konoha. Naruto was on the hump of Orenji's back. As they walked with the boy, Orochimaru and Orenji saw the dark looks towards the boy. When one got too close to his liking, Orenji would hiss loudly causing the civilians to move several feet back. Naruto clapped as he enjoyed hearing Orenji's hissing noises. They knew who was taking care of the boy. However, it would be asinine for a normal civilian to go up against one of the greatest legends in Konoha's history. So instead they took the coward's way out and started talking about the boy calling him a demon and other demoralizing names. The civilians thought they were smart as they knew that they could do that without any form of punishment because ninjas cannot directly attack civilians without being physically provoked. However, it was not smart to verbally provoke the hubby Sanin. When Orochimaru went a few blocks up, he did a quick hand sign. In an instant, one could hear the fearful screams of civilians getting snake bit. Orochi's group finally reached the Shinobi R Us Kids store. Naruto's little eyes went wide at the massive size of the building. Unlike most babies, he was more excited than afraid. He giggled as he squirmed around. Orochimaru had no choice but to smile at the boy. Naru-chan, do you want to come in? Naruto nodded with excitement rolling off in waves. Orochi decided to tease the boy a little bit further. Are you sure you want to go in, Naru-chan? Naruto just giggled as he wiggled side to side. As he squealed, he jumped up and down on poor Orenji. 
The poor snake just hissed at Orochi. Orochi didn't know if it was for what happened earlier with the original or the fact that he instigated what Naruto was doing to him. He smirked somewhat. He said, Okay, okay Naru-chan, we're going in, but we'll go in if you stop jumping on Orenji. Okay. Naruto promptly stopped causing Orenji to breathe a sigh of relief. They went into the store and were surprised. Naruto jumped up and down on Orenji as he saw how big the store was. Orochimaru agreed with Naruto. The shinobi store was bigger than the three expected. It was basically a supermall just full of shinobi toys. Orochimaru thought to himself, damn I was born in the wrong generation. There is like 11 stories in this building. I did hear that Jiraiya was working on the seals for this store, but he really outdid himself. I don't know who's giddier the brat or me. Naruto enthusiastically said, big, big. Orochimaru patted his head. Yes Naruto-kun, it is very big. Why don't we explore it, nay? Naruto nodded with much enthusiasm. Orochimaru had his calculating face on. Orochimaru was not one to be intimidated by such people. Danzo was the same way as Orochimaru. Danzo calmly said, it has been a while Orochimaru-kun. Today is a beautiful day so I thought it would be beneficial for my old bones to bask and thrive in the sun. Orochi narrowed his eyes. He knew this was no meet and greet. He inwardly frowned as he put a smirk on his face. Why yes today is a great day to enjoy the air. However, it is peculiar for you to come and show up in my house unannounced. I would be extremely grateful if you got rid of those gentlemen who ever so gently place themselves into the wall. After all it is almost time for fall cleaning. Danzo frowned slightly. With a wave of his hand, five root ninjas disappeared. Danzo said, You know Orochimaru. You are more like me than you think you know. Orochimaru inwardly frowned at this. Orochimaru, we both are disappointed in how Konoha has changed. We both have been cut out on our chance to become the leader of the leaf. Now you are stuck with. Orochimaru had enough of this. This war hawk was treading on dangerous water. His frown grew deeper with each word. He put a sarcastic look on his face. He said, You know Danzo sama, this is really boring. I mean with all this chatter over who should have been the Hokage with your monotonous voice is just a snore. I prefer someone that is more vibrant who has great charisma who could rile up the troops. You can't do that, so you just wallow in the dirt. Danzo calmly looked at the hubby Sanin. He wanted to kill the Sanin but knew that would not be plausible especially since he had a few favors to cash in. Hum so this is the sarcastic Orochimaru that I've heard Serutobi talk about. I am impressed. However, that is irrelevant. I would like to cash in one of my favors. Orochimaru's eyes narrowed at the old man. Orochimaru owed a few favors to the man especially when he was younger, when he first started to experiment on different things. Orochimaru said with feigned surprise, Uso that's what you were here for. You want to cash in on your favor. However, it makes me wonder why you would come out this early. Would you care to explain? Hmm. Danzo closed his lone eye and said, well Orochimaru, I thought it would be nice to do business in the sunlight. After all it is not like you will backstab me since I have a variety of what you call dirt on you. Orochimaru frowned at this. He drummed his fingers on the table. Well Danzo there is a difference between you and me. You see, if you even thought about bringing out Operation Wood, it would open more worms for you. I mean after all, Tenzo was trained by your subordinates. I have it documented and with one fell swoop I could take your whole organization down to the ground. You are nowhere near as strong as you used to be. So, you won't be able to get away from your pursuers. I, on the other hand, can survive and escape. So, I should warn you to not threaten me. It would be against your best interest. Now what is this favor of yours? Danzo simply smirked at Orochimaru. This caused Orochimaru to shudder in the inside. Danzo said, well Orochimaru, I want you to create an array of seals. The main is a control seal. Orochimaru's clone was not having a much better time. Naruto was driving him nuts. The boy did not want to stay still and touched everything in the store. It did not matter if it was wooden practice kanais or glass cases. Naruto was curious as he saw the black pants. He tugged on it. He kept pulling onto it until the clothes rack fell on top of him or it would have. Orochimaru luckily caught the rack breathing a sigh of relief. 
Naruto on the other hand giggled and clapped as he almost knocked over the clothes rack. Orochimaru gave him an angry look. Naruto, you know better than this. Naruto adopted a sad look on his young whiskered face. Before Naruto could let his small tears out, his ear twitched. He had heard this voice before but didn't know from where. Orochimaru-sama and Naruto-kun, it's great to see you here. Orochimaru turned and saw Sum in Azuka and her two young children, Hana and Kiba. Orochimaru was grateful to see the feral woman. She had helped him through the whole ordeal. He had learned things that he hoped Takami to never have to do again. He shuddered at the thought as Sum came over. She looked down to see the small kid. She said, how's the pup doing? He's growing up so fast. I see his teeth are starting to come in. Orochimaru involuntarily froze up. When Naruto first started teething, it was a nightmare. All Naruto kept doing was screaming, yelling, crying every few seconds. The first tooth was the canine tooth. Orochimaru had to shudder once again as he remembered when Naruto, accidentally, bit him with that ferociously strong canine tooth. Oh, the agony was the only thing that crossed the hubby Sanin's mind. Why yes, he's grown up a lot. It feels like yesterday he could fit into my hand. Now he can walk albeit with a bit of a stumble. He could talk a little bit. His curiosity however is extraordinary. The problem is I don't know if that is a good thing. I had to replace my good kanais with wood ones just in case the little one goes playing whack a kanai. Soon gave a hearty laugh as she understood. She had to do that with Hannah after she kind of stabbed her father. It was kind of funny now that Soon thought about it. Soon said, I understand completely. It feels weird that it has been a few years since the event. Orochimaru nodded. He said, I concur. He's growing up so fast. I'm happy to know that I am helping to ease his burden. Hey Naruto-kun, can you tell Soon san how old you're going to be in a few days? Naruto gained a thoughtful look that made Hana say kawaii. He held out his pointer and middle finger as he said, Aichi, ni. Ni. Orochimaru and Soon clapped as Orochimaru said, Very good Naruto-kun. Soon said, Very impressive, Orochimaru. I must admit you are taking this very seriously. Soon reached down and gave Naruto one of the new Inazuka-styled wooden practice kanai. Naruto's eyes shimmered in the light as he held his new toy. Orochimaru had a smile on his face. He said, Naru-kun, what do you say to Soom san Naruto replied, A hey, arigato. Soom ruffled his head as he looked at his toy. Meanwhile Hana was becoming a little impatient. Why does Ka-san want to converse with this guy? We picked up my throwing weapons. So, can't we just go? What is so interesting about a baby? He doesn't look that much different from other babies. He doesn't look like whatever his name is. He looks like he has our marks. Maybe he is a relative. It all makes sense. He is one of us. But why isn't he living with us? I'll ask Ka San later. While Soom was conversing some more with the hubby Sanin and Hana was musing her barely five year old thoughts, Naruto got bored. Orochimaru learned a few months ago, when Naruto got bored, all hell breaks loose. Naruto saw a guy who was looking at him the wrong way. He sneered at Naruto as he whispered, Demon. Something swelled up in Naruto telling him of the negative connotation of that word. Before anyone knew what happened, the man soon regretted his words. Splat, a huge scream filled the room. It alerted every shinobi in the building as each pulled a kanai out from their hiding spot including Orochimaru and Soom. What the hell is going on, Soom san She sniffed the air and said, there is blood in the air. She turned to where she smelled the blood. Orochimaru and Soom's eyes went wide. The manager who whispered demon is on the floor bleeding with a wooden kanai jammed into the back of his right thigh. Soom and Orochimaru rushed over to the man checking his vital signs while Orenji and Kuromaru watched over Naruto, Hana, and the sleeping Kiba. Orochimaru pulled out one of his nerve depressant syringes and injected it into the man. Afterwards he pulled out the kanai from the man's thigh. Soom's eyes went wide. That was the kanai she just gave to Naruto. Did Naruto throw that kanai? That's impossible. He's only one turning two years old. Orochimaru-sama. That's the same kanai I just gave Naruto-kun. That kanai should not be able to pierce skin as the tip is rounded. In addition, that kanai has an inner spring in which on contact it would bounce off the person. 
So, for someone to throw it, it can't get through. Orochimaru frowned slightly on the outside. In the inside, he was a little more excited. Did Naruto activate one of his bloodlines? There is only one person I know that could do that with pure force and jam it in there and that would be Tsunade, but Naruto threw it. For a baby to be able to do that is extraordinary. That kind of power to override the spring and rounded top and have it jabbed it in the thigh. However, I want to know what this guy did to piss Naruto off. I have a distinct feeling that this guy probably deserved it. The crowd was forced to leave when Orochimaru called false alarm and told everyone to go back to shopping. Orochi told Soom, he could handle it from here and when the party will start. When she left with Kiba and Hana, Orochimaru told Orenji to come there along with baby Naruto. The manager had a somewhat scared look on his face. It did not help that Orochimaru gave him the, I'm going to kill you myself, look. Orochi gave Naruto his all too sweet smile. He said, Naruto-kun, did you throw this kanai at this young man? Naruto nodded slowly, he knew internally he would be reprimanded. Orochimaru said, well Naruto what did the man do to deserve this? Naruto shouted out, demon, demon, demon. Orochimaru's eyebrow rose, he looked dangerously at the manager, who was sweating bullets. He turned his head to the side. Is that so, Naruto-kun? Well Mr. Manager, it seems like we have a little problem. It would be crucial for you to tell me the truth. If you are a good boy. Orochimaru was cut off by a gruff voice, Orochimaru-sama, what's going on? Why is my manager on the floor bleeding? Orochimaru grew a huge smirk, while the manager shook his head begging Orochi not to tell. Of course, Orochimaru really didn't care about the man's plight. Well Ishio, it has been a while hasn't it? You see there was a slight scuffle. It seems like your manager called poor Naruto kun here a demon. Now Naruto being a baby, and all threw a kanai at him. Surprisingly it got wedged in his leg. I would take full responsibility, however he said that no no word right in front of Naruto kun. As we all know it is illegal to say such a word to the boy, but he was a bit bold, nay. Ishio's eyes narrowed at the manager who was praying to Kami that he would lose his job not his life. Ishio sighed as he replied, I see. This is a big problem. Unfortunately, my oldest daughter would probably kill me if I didn't do anything to save her fiancé. That's why he has the job anyway. He is not much to bat an eye at. So Orochimaru as your former student, I would be ever so grateful as to compensate young Naruto here with a lifetime membership in which he gets anything he wants for free for his whole life that includes the ninja store when he is old enough. What? How can that little? The manager didn't get to finish when Ishio put a kanai at his neck. I would suggest you close your mouth, or I'll slit your scrawny neck faster than a whistle would blow. You have caused enough problems with your mouth. So just be quiet or I'll let Orochimaru-sama deal with you. The manager gulped as he slowly nodded. Orochimaru smirked. He said, I would gratefully accept your offer, Ishio-kun. By the way how is your other daughter now? Isn't she almost three? Ishio said, yeah, Tenten is three now. Sheesh, it feels so weird having one daughter who is twenty and the other who's three. She's growing up so fast. She's able to throw kanais almost as good as a ten-year-old. It has to be from the mother. Orochimaru laughed at this. He said, that's great. She sounds like she's going to be a great kunoichi. If they're going to be this determined to be shinobi like Tenten then it will be a good indication of great years in Konoha. I agree wholeheartedly. Is there anything you need prepared Orochimaru-sama? I have a few things in mind. A few hours had passed since the encounter in the shinobi store and Orochimaru was beat. He had worked extensively on the seals for Danzo while he checked on Naruto's vital signs. To be honest, he was more interested in Naruto's chakra streams and blood stream. For some reason Naruto's body was becoming denser by the second. Orochimaru saw that it was going three even four times past that of a normal child. He saw the DNA sequences were molding together with Naruto's. So, everything was going smooth with Naruto's development. However, his mind went back to the incident in the store. I didn't see anything like that before in my life. I've checked the bloodlines that I injected into him. They are binding like I hoped but not a single one has become the dominant one. They haven't exactly formed yet but that doesn't mean we shouldn't have a forerunner. 
That must mean there is something else. Maybe he got something from his parents. Let's see. Minato, as strong as he is, would not be able to do that. Kashina on the other hand had strength, Kenjutsu, Ninjutsu and Fuinjutsu along with a bloodline. She most assuredly didn't have the power, speed or throwing ability to do that. I disassembled the tip of the blade and saw the trigger was up to date. For some reason it did not recognize the impact to that, s head. It is highly disturbing that he could do this. Maybe I'm looking too much into this. Wait a minute, I have an idea, maybe I could investigate who his grandparents are. If I find something, then I'll say it's them but if it isn't. Orochimaru was taken out of his thoughts by a shadowy figure. Hello Orochimaru. Orochimaru's eyes narrowed as he looked at his new problem guest. He finally put Naruto to bed and to be honest he was deadbeat tired. He didn't even have enough energy to be his snarky self. The shadowy figure said in his gruff voice, You have become lax, Orochimaru. You know how I hate to wait on anything. Orochimaru sighed as he closed his research. He said, Hey, masterpieces take time. You especially should know that. To be brutally honest, I'm surprised that you can get here especially looking like that. However, since you don't ask about my secrets, I won't ask about yours. Since you are here, I'm going to take an educated guess and say you have finally defected. The shadowy figure nodded at Orochimaru's assessment. He said, it seems like your cognitive skills haven't been hampered in your aging. Leader Sama has altered the plan slightly. Some unwanted attention has been snooping around. He wants us to vacation one by one every year to throw off these unwanted pests until we expose ourselves. You are to vacation in two years in early January and meet at the rendezvous. Orochimaru frowned slightly but nodded. The figure continued, now Orochimaru since that is out of the way, it's time to talk about the other reason I'm here. Do you have it ready yet? Orochimaru smirked at the figure. He created a shadow clone to go into the basement. A few moments passed until the shadow clone came back up. Orochimaru said, I am always prompt when it comes to my projects. That should never have crossed your mind. The question is do you have what I want? The figure pulled out the scroll that was in his coat. He tossed the scroll over to the hubby Sanin. The Sanin caught it as the shadow clone gave the man the scroll. Orochimaru opened the scroll and his eyes went wide. He closed it quickly as he said, How do I know this is the real stuff? How can I trust you to give me it? The man was surprisingly calm. He said, Orochimaru. I don't gain anything from having that blood with me. It doesn't matter to me. Whatever reason you want it so bad does not concern me. I don't need to trick you. Quote. Orochimaru had to agree with the man. The shadowed man opened the scroll and saw the project that he requested Orochimaru to do for him. The thing was throbbing as the seal pulsed. The man felt his dream come to fruition. Orochimaru said, All you need to do is put chakra in it and it will do the rest. I suspect that it will be chakra consuming and you will most likely be exposed. So, you shouldn't do it here but at the base. Quote. The man nodded as he closed the scroll up and tucked it in his pocket. He said, I could feel this can be a start of a wonderful friendship Orochi. I will see you in two years. With that the shadowy man disappeared. Orochimaru simply chuckled as he said, I think so too, Akasuna no Sasori. It has been six months since the party. Naruto has changed a lot. He grew a little taller. Much to the dismay of Orochimaru, his hair was still spiked up. No matter how much Orochi tried to comb it, it did not go down. Naruto now was able to voice his opinion just a little bit better. But right now, Orochimaru thought it would be a great time to learn how to throw kanais. They were in Orochimaru's personal training area. Orochimaru was practicing with Naruto on how to legitimately throw his kanai. Okay Naruto, I want you to hit the red dot right over there. Naruto's comprehension and understanding of things has grown at such an alarming rate it even concerned Orochimaru slightly. While other people would call Naruto a prodigy if they knew, Orochimaru saw more determination than anything else. He had seen it in Naruto before. Naruto saw some of the other kids climb a tree. Naruto tried it himself but failed the first time and fell. However he kept trying until he was up in the tree. It scared the hell out of Orochimaru because he was worried he would go and kill himself, 
and to a lesser extent be worried that Naruto's determination and will would not allow him to be taken over. Naruto focused at the red dot as much as a two-year-old could and through the kunai. The throw was not focused resulting in the kunai spinning, instead of straight. The big target was hit with the handle of the kunai instead of the blade. Orochi's eyes were wide because even though it was hit with the hilt, the kunai hit the red dot and the kunai was lodged into the target. Orochimaru tried to keep his astonishment from reaching his voice as he spoke, Naruto-kun, that was okay throw. It aim was great but the throw was spinning and not. Something whizzed right past the hubby Sanin cutting few strands of hair of the Sanin. Orochi looked back and saw the blade was lodged in a tree between a pair of rabbit ears. Orochi's eyes went wide as he looked into Naruto's eyes. Naruto's eyes went from the carefree ocean blue eyes to a darker shade of blue filled with determination. Naruto said, Target, I hit target. Orochimaru had shock written all over his face. Orochimaru had never seen anything like this before in his 40 years of life. What is it about Naru kun that makes him change from carefree to determine in that little bit of time? His throws are deadly accurate and powerful. He has to stay focused so he could throw it right. Right now I'll send a clone to look into his genetics while I take Naruto kun to Ichiraku. During this time Naruto had found out what his favorite food was. Oh how Naruto loved his ramen. Orochimaru took him one day to a yame in Tyuki. He drank just a little bit of broth and was swooned. He could stop eating it make Orochimaru of the Sanin feel like a genin living paycheck to paycheck. To Naruto it was a once in a month delicacy for the sake of the poor Sanin. Orochimaru put the boy on his shoulder as he did one hand sign. In an instant, Naruto and Orochi disappeared in a swirl of leaves. Orochimaru's shadow clone had been extensively researching Naruto and who his grandparents were. Due to the fact that he is the head of the research and development department, he was able to access the servers that had what he was looking for remotely. He thought, okay, computer what do you have for me? He typed the name Kashina Uzumaki into the database. The computer went through many different names until it locked onto Kashina's picture. When Orochimaru looked at the screen it showed her information. It said, Name, Kashina Uzumaki, Age, 20, Gender, Female, Parents, Classified, Hair Color, Red, Eye Color, Green, Rank, Anbu Commander, Status, Deceased. Orochimaru's clone had a visible frown on it. Since he was the one who created this database, it unnerved him that he was unable to get in. He did a few of his hacking tricks and opened up the parents' files. Orochimaru's eyes went wide at Kashina's parents were. My, my Naruto-kun, you did choose a very good mother. Now let's see how about your father. While Orochimaru's clone was checking on Naruto's genealogy, the real Orochimaru took Naruto to Ichiraku for a treat. Orochimaru said, now Naruto-kun what kind of ramen do you want? Naruto said with much enthusiasm, miso. Miso. The chef chuckled as he stirred the pot of noodles. Orochimaru said, Tyuki-san, how is the family? Tyuki sighed. Times have been hard for him and his family. His wife had stage 4 cancer and she was not going to live much longer. They have been trying to fool poor Ayame. Ayame is only 5 years old but she knew something was wrong with her mom. She plays Nurse Ayame to get her mother's spirits up. Chuki said to Orochi in his sad voice, it's not so good. You know the wife might be going away soon. It's been hard for Ayame. She knows something is wrong but we try to keep a brave face and say it was a cold. She plays games trying to make her mother happy except it makes her even sadder as she won't see her grow up. With the tone of Chuki's voice, Naruto had gained a sad smile on his face. He didn't know why but he felt sadness roll off of him. Orochimaru could feel it also. He said, I'm so sorry for your loss. I wish there was something I could to help you. If you need anything just ask. Chuki nodded as he gave Naruto his salty noodles. This was the first time Naruto didn't have the appetite to eat his ramen. He played around with it and ate some as Orochimaru drank some water. He could see even from an early age that Naruto could sense the emotions around him. This would be good for Naruto as he would be able to empathize with people. Yet it is a horrible trait as it would make it that much harder for Orochi to complete his plan. For that matter, he wondered if he wanted to go through with his plan but he has gone through too much to flip the switch now. 
He saw Naruto was finished with his ramen. Orochi put the money on the table. He sighed as he said to Naruto, Come Naruto-kun, let's go to the park. Chuki-san, I left the money on the counter. We'll come by and visit some more sometime. With that Orochimaru did one hand sign and the two disappeared in a swirl of leaves. Naruto and Orochimaru reached the playground. Naruto saw children playing ninja, while others played on the swing set. Orochimaru could see the joyful look on the young boy's face. The hubby Sanin said, Go ahead Naruto-kun. Go play I'll be right over there. Naruto nodded as he ran to go to the swings. Orochimaru sighed, as he sat down in one of the board game's chairs. It is almost time to take a permanent, vacation, from the leaf. However his thoughts were wandering to the boy. The boy would be left alone mostly likely for dead. So what could he? Hello Orochimaru. Orochimaru knew that bored voice anywhere. He grew a smirk on his pale white face. It is great to see you too, Shikaku. The Nara clan head sat down on the opposite side of the hubby Sanin. Shikaku pulled a scroll out of his pocket. This scroll had the kanji for the word, Shogi. Shikaku said, Wanna play a game? The wife is watching the young ones. Orochimaru saw Yoshino watching Shikamaru, Choji, Ino, and surprisingly Naruto. He could see that Yoshino was manipulating the kids' shadows to create a barrier around them to make sure no one bothered them. If Orochi was honest, he would have to say that the Nara clan was the most trustworthy of the remaining clans. They were calm, calculative, and honest but the men from what he had heard were lazy. Orochi said, sure why not? Shikaku smiled as he set the board. Shikaku said while moving the first piece, it has been a long two years has it not? How's fatherhood treating you? Orochimaru moved his piece as he spoke. It has been a long two years. Naruto has been a hassle and a half yet he is shaping up to be a prodigy maybe even a genius. Shikaku was silent for a moment before he moved his piece. How so Orochimaru? I mean he's only what two and a half years old. Is it not a little early to be calling anyone a prodigy much less a genius? Orochimaru saw Shikaku's trap from the very first move. He moved a piece in a very unconventional way. Orochi had his infamous smirk on his face. That is what is wrong with your generation. Because you guys have not experienced the means of a true prodigy or genius other than Minato, you guys are shooting in the dark as to who is and isn't. Shikaku analyzed Orochi's move before he moved. He said, I disagree Orochimaru-san. Many of you called us prodigy of something. A true prodigy and genius is Fugaku's oldest son, Itachi. Orochi stroked his chin as he looked at the board. He moved another piece as he said, True, yet there are many different types and forms of genius along with an array of prodigies. Of course we look at genius as a person who has an IQ in the high hundreds. That is the traditional sense of the word. People like that are Itachi, you, and I. Shika made his move on the field. Unconscious to what he just did he said, Since you used the word traditional, there must be an untraditional way. What would you consider to be untraditional genius? For that matter who would you consider to be one? Orochimaru laughed inwardly. His smirk grew wider as he spoke. Well Shikaku, the untraditional genius would be my teammate Jiraiya. When we first were a cell, he looked like a bumbling idiot, who Tsunade and I considered holding us back. I had the talent. Tsunade had the talent and abilities. Jiraiya had something we didn't have. He had determination. He worked his ass off. We didn't recognize it but he was also a genius. He is a genius of hard work and determination. He also had one more thing we didn't have. You see Shikaku, he thinks of life as a game of shogi. He always considered himself all the pieces but one, the king. He felt the king need to protect it. Shikaku cut him off, so the king is the Hokage, right? Orochimaru laughed. Yes the hubby Sanin laughed at the traditional genius. He said, if you believe that then you are definitely not a genius. Shikaku scowled at Orochi's insult but said nothing as he was curious as to whom this, king, was. Orochi continued, you see the, king, is not the king per se. The king is the thing, whether it is a person or an item, place, or even an idea that drives you to great lengths to protect. A perfect example is the raven-haired woman that was my student and now your wife. Yoshino-chan, used to train past her limits to get into your lazy heart especially during the war. You were the Nara prodigy, 
the one who could outsmart your famous genius of a father in everything. You were the one who supposedly able outsmart all but one person in your class and that was Minato. She on the other hand was the weak side of the Nara clan. Her mother and father were cast out of the clan because it was believed that they were not able to do shadow type jutsus. They were not the smartest of people. Yoshino chan was above average but considered much lower than you. So when you had Gure Serutobi as a sensei, she had me. She trained herself to the brink over and over again. I would put all the money I have on her beating you because she had the determination to do it. You were laid back and believed that you could always be clutch even though you did not practice. But you remember what happened when Kumo had you trapped. Your perception could not have saved you. However since you were her king, she used all the stops she knew which included all the laps with 300 pounds strapped onto her short frame. She reached you in time and instead of you being dead, she took the kanais into her right shoulder. You, all you got was a slash on your chin. She would have made Jonan but the injury rendered her arm weak. She sacrificed herself for you. She had overcome so much and was on her way to be an Anbu captain in three years but gave it all away for the one she loved. Some people would call her stupid. However a genius in the non-traditional way is the one who under pressure is always clutch and knows what they have to do even when the probability of success is less than zero. A genius is one who picks his or her battles. A genius in the non-traditional way is the one who does not know the word give up and is intelligent on the one thing that matter to them. Just like this very game, you are not the genius. You are talented but still very flawed. With that Orochimaru had taken Shikaku's king. Shikaku's eyes were extremely wide. He never lost a game of shogi. Yet here it was, in front of his very black pupils, Orochi had taken his king. He could not close his mouth as the words that came out of Orochi's mouth struck a nerve in him. He still didn't know why Orochi called Naruto a genius but he did give him a lot to think about. Orochimaru's clone was having a big problem. He looked into the database to see Naruto's genealogy from his father's side. He typed in Minato Namikaze into the computer. He easily found his file and opened it. The computer screen said. Name. Minato Namikaze. Age. 20. Gender. Male. Parents. Ayoshi and Naoti Namikaze. Eye color. Blue. Rank. Yandaimi Hokage. Status. Deceased. Orochimaru's clone frowned deeply. There was something odd about Minato's file. The first inconsistency was that it said his age was 20 when in fact he would be 25. He however chalked that up to the fact that was how old Minato was when he died. The second inconsistency was the fact that Minato's parents were not classified. When a person reached the rank of Jonan, the parents' file would become classified just in case someone was able to hack in and use the family as leverage. There were some cases in which the parent was a powerful or legendary ninja like Kakashi's father. Minato's parents were not anything like that. The two were in fact civilians. It got worse because some things didn't add up in Orochimaru's mind. Naoti Namikaze was not able to bear children and at the time was in her early 50s when Minato was supposedly born. She died 10 years later. She could not possibly be Minato's mother. Ayoshi on the other hand had no common features with Minato. This can't be right. He used the database to pull up a picture of Ayoshi. He put the picture right next to Minato. It was evidently clear. Minato was not the son of Ayoshi. Damn it. If Ayoshi isn't the father then who could it be? It doesn't make sense. This has to be a trap move. It is weird leaving who his supposed parents are wide open for anyone can see. I can't bring this to the Hokage. That would be a very bad idea. I have to figure out a way to get authorization for the blood cells to Minato. I can't do what I did with the Shodai and Nadaim and the others in Konoha. I was only able to successfully steal them was during an attack on Konoha. Maybe I could use the excuse of genetic diseases that run in the family. No, that won't work all it would do is create more problems and suspicion as to what is going on with Naruto-kun. Minato, you are real something aren't you? Wait a moment. I know what I'm going to do. The question is where did I put Naruto's original blood sample? Naruto was having fun with his new friends as they talked their own language. It must be extremely funny as Naruto, Ino, and Choji even Shika were laughing as if it was the funniest thing in the world. Yoshino smiled as she kept her shadow jutsu over the children. She loved children especially seeing her Shika having fun. 
Her face grew a gracious smile on it. Someone tapped her on her shoulder. Much to her surprise it was Harini Hayuga, the new matriarch of the Hayuga clan. She was about 5 feet 2 inches tall. She had the famous Byakugan. The difference was that the pupilous eyes were a violet color. She had a noticeable bump in her stomach. As she walked with such grace and royalty, she spoke, Yoshino-chan, it is great to see you. How is the younger generation of the Inoshika Cho? Yoshino smiled as she said, Harini-chan, it has been much too long. They are fine just playing with young Naruto-kun here. Harini saw the blonde-haired boy and smiled. She was not like most main house Hayugas. She was kind-hearted and like Yoshino loved children. Naruto was no exception. She thought that what Naruto has in him is a burden that she hopes would not kill him. Yoshino noticed her, bump, Yoshino said, How are the Hinkun and Hanada-chan? I see that you are adding someone new into the family. Yoshino had the all-knowing smirk on her face. Harini blushed a deep red at this. She unconsciously rubbed her belly at this. She said, Can't put one past you can I, Yoshino-chan. I'm three months in. I can't believe I'm having my third child. Hiyashi actually has been smiling a whole lot more. You should have seen him when Heen was born. He was more of a wreck than I was. Before Heen came out, I thought he was delivering him. The two were laughing just as hard as the babies. What they didn't know was Orochi was listening in on the conversation. The Hyuga matriarch continued, with Hanada Chan, it was so much different. His heart melted at her purple eyes. He wanted a daughter but then it hit him. Boys will be coming at his door to court Hanada Chan in 13 or so years. His face turned to stone as he went into his study. He was in there for three hours. I was actually worried about him. He came out with a scroll and gave it to me. His stern look scared me as he handed it to me. When I opened it I bust of laughing. I couldn't stop. Yoshino asked with pure curiosity written on her face. What did it say? It took a minute for Harini to respond. She could not for the life of her to stop laughing at poor Hiyashi. When she finally caught her breath, she calmed down somewhat. She said while giggling, Hiyashi wrote as the title, 10 simple rules for dating my daughter, he had lost his mind. After I read the rules and laughed some more, all I could see was his face twitching and his hair frayed. You could even tell that his hands were shaking because of the chicken scratch handwriting. He was a total mess. They kept laughing as Naruto's little group were playing three a game and the dads were playing shogi. This continued until evening. Later that evening, Orochimaru with his Sanin rites was able to leave Konoha for a while. The reason the Sanin rites were invoked was because the Sanin each had their own set of spy bases. They would have to meet outside of Konoha and not in the traditional form. He had summoned Orenji to watch over Naruto as he had some things that he had to take care of. He reached the southeast border in no time. He patiently waited for someone to come. He looked at the location of the moon to tell him what time it was. Orochimaru thought angrily, where the hell is he? He was supposed to be here minutes ago. There better be a good explanation. The Anbu is protecting the other side tonight. In a moment, a blurry figure came into the dark night. He was a tall, slim man with dark eyes and a black beard. He wears a different flak jacket indicating he is from another village. His head was bandaged and forehead protector covered his right eye. Orochimaru scowled as he had other things to do like examining Naruto's blood sample. The man saw Orochi's eyes and grimaced. He said, Orochimaru-sama, I can explain there has been extreme tension in the borders between Iwa and Kumo. I had to properly time my escape. Please forgive me. Orochi had an impassive face. He said in an apathetic tone, don't let it happen again. The man bowed as he let Orochimaru finish speaking. So do you have the samples I asked for? It would be very bad for you if I do not get what I ask for, especially for what you were asking for in return. The man started to sweat. He could only get two out of the three. Unfortunately for him Orochimaru only had a little bit of time to finish his project. Every little delay becomes a bigger problem for the Habi Sanin. Orochimaru's eyes became narrow as he could clearly see something was not right. The man said, Orochimaru-sama, I could only get two of the samples. The other one has been destroyed or relocated. Please forgive me. We desperately need another bloodline to survive. Orochimaru rolled his eyes at the man. I must disagree with your statement. You are not in need of another bloodline. In fact you have not one but two Jinchurikis. So don't give me that. You have failed me on this mission. I guess your whole squadrons are horrible as you could not take a bloodline from the civil war in Kiri. That is absolutely shameful. 
They were basically asking to be taken and you couldn't get one. You guys are pathetic. However it is understandable, your cage is getting up there in age. The man inwardly growled as the Sanin just insulted his cage. Unfortunately, the man had to bite his pride and bow to Orochimaru. My apologies Orochimaru-sama. I hope you were able to forgive my insolence. Orochimaru really wanted to kill this guy. He knew the man wasn't fully sorry and that he wanted him to drop dead. However he is a pawn to his greater plans. He said, I can forgive many people's insolence like if the carrier gives me someone else's mail. The difference is that he is about 98% effective. You on the other hand are not even worth an ounce of my forgiveness. I forgive those who are usually effective about 100%. You came to me late even though I have things to do. Now you tell me you were only able to get 2 out of 3 samples, which if I'm not mistaken is 66.666667% success rate. So not only are you not punctual but you cannot even succeed in a something as easy as that and you are a higher ranked head ninja. So forgiveness is out of the equation. You fail me again, you die. It is as simple as that. You will meet me in 5 months. Bring me the sample and you will get the Hyuga. Orochimaru did not hold back his clear disdain of the head ninja. The ninja had a deep frown as the anger welled inside of him. His palms started to bleed. The reason was his nails dug themselves into palms of his hand. One could see him shaking in anger. Orochi smirked inwardly on for it to be erased as he saw the man grow a smirk. The man said, Oh Orochimaru, I wouldn't be threatening anyone, if I were you. This made Orochi's eyebrows to rise. Everything had been going according to plan but this asshole was threatening him, a guy that could level most of this man's country. I want to see how this is going to develop. Really for a person who cannot complete one task, you sure are talking a pretty big game. I would hope for your country's sake there are not many incompetent ninjas there. I mean after all you wouldn't want to things up and have another war. Now do you? Orochimaru was definitely in this man's head. However the man had grown a huge smirk on his face. You're right Orochi. We could not possibly want the Sanin to be beat us. But you do have something that we can take. I think his name is Naruto. Orochimaru's eyes narrowed. He rarely got angry but when he did, it was cornering a rattlesnake. You were going to get hurt. Orochimaru lifted up his hand. With a swift move five snakes came out of his sleeve. The five snakes grew as they wrapped around the man. As he tried to scream, the snakes constricted him even more. Orochimaru walked up to the head ninja. His eyes told the man he might have taken a step too far. Orochimaru pulled a kanai out of his pocket. He said with a threatening tone, you have quickly forgotten your place. I do not condone a pathetic weakling like you threatening my son. At this time I don't give a flying who told you but I swear on your life if I find out you or any one of your people even put a hand on the boy, you will die. I'm going to give you a deterrent for your ignorance. Orochimaru showed his strength by jamming the kanai past the man's forehead protector and stabbing the man's eye. The man tried to scream but could not say anything as the snakes made it impossible to breath. The snakes sank their vipers into the man. He felt as if he was about to pass out. The snakes disappeared in a puff of smoke. Orochimaru said, you will live for now with one eye. I gave you a reason to wear that stupid protector like that. Now get out of my sight, you little shit. If you fail me again, I will make you snake chow. Better yet you will be my little experiment. The man, who was woozy and in deep pain, could only nodded. He disappeared into the shadowy trees albeit in a painful manner. Orochi frowned as went back to his home. He had six months to prepare his departure and to train Naruto. As he thought about the man's threat, he could only think about was the boy's safety. Maybe the boy was becoming a liability to him, after all. Orochimaru had been in his study reading up on the pathogens that he created for Naruto. It has been four months since Orochimaru had the conversation with the head ninja. During this time he had injected Naruto with the two newly created pathogens. Orochimaru saw that his window of injecting Naruto with any more bloodlines was quickly closing. Naruto's body had a very bad reaction to the two new injections. His body started to convulse and he almost lost Naruto. Orochimaru was quite disgusted with himself seeing as he raised this boy and he has caused more pain than anyone else. Naruto, now three years old, was lucky that the Kyubi was sealed inside of him or else the pathogen would have surely ended his life. As he mulled over what had occurred he saw the two almost three-year-old stumble into his study. Two San. Look at what I can do. Orochimaru with curiosity evident on his face watched the boy. 
Naruto dropped the kanai on the floor creating a thud on contact. Orochi was not impressed but let the boy continue his act. Sure enough Naruto pointed his finger at the kanai. Orochi's eyes went wide as he saw Naruto release a chakra string and connect it to the kanai. Naruto with little to no difficulty lift the kanai up and caught it in his hand. Orochimaru eyes went wide. Naruto had gained many side effects from the pathogens. Naruto grew about six inches during this time. His mind was able process to things at a rate that should be impossible for a child his age. His vocabulary, with the help of Orochimaru, is astonishing. Orochi could see that Naruto had great command of his chakra. Naruto could be a huge threat in the immediate future. Orochimaru could tell that he would be great especially if he could effectively use the chakra strings. He pulled out a little action figure toy and gave it to the young boy. Orochimaru said, that's amazing Naruto-kun. Can you make Mr. Leaf move without touching him? It took a few moments for Naruto to understand. His blue eyes lit up. This was a test of his abilities. Orochimaru had given Naruto different types of tests like the alphabet, and numbers. Whenever he did well on it they would go train and afterwards either go to the park and or Ichirakus. Orochi saw Naruto's eyes turn a slightly darker cover. The boy saw the Mr. Leaf toy won the floor. To Naruto, it was as if the toy was edging him on. It was mocking him and Naruto did not want to be mocked. He lifted his hand up. He concentrated his thoughts onto the figure as if it was the only thing there. With a slight grunt not one, not two but five chakra strings came out of Naruto's little hands. Orochi watched in fascination as Naruto's little fingers were able to conjure up these chakra strings. At this point he didn't care if Naruto could make the toy dance. Just the mere fact he could make five chakra strings at the age of two is simply unbelievable. Naruto made it even more unbelievable when he used his control over the figure to make it dance. I did it too San. I was able to make Mr. Leaf dance. Orochimaru could hear the boy's enthusiasm along with pride and satisfaction in his voice. It was good to see the boy was so proud of what he had done. He smiled as Bipet the boy's head. He said, well done, Naruto-kun, I'm so proud of you. How about I give you a treat? We're going to go outside in the backyard. Since today is a training day for Anko, I'll bring you with us so you can learn about the elements. Naruto had the look of confusion. He didn't know what the elements were fully but anytime he was able to learn something, he would gladly do it. Naruto nodded with enthusiasm. Naruto wanted to see his friend Anko. Orochimaru took Anko as an official apprentice last year but she has been around him for about three years since he came to the academy. She comes regularly and helps take care of Naruto. Orochimaru said, Okay, Naruto-kun, I'll send Orenji to go get her. A few minutes passed until Anko got to Orochimaru's backyard. She was about 4 feet 9 inches tall. She has brownish amber pupil less eyes. Her hair is light purple that went down to her neck. She had her mother's necklace around her neck. She saw her sensei teaching Naruto about the elements. Now, Naruto this is called Katen. Katen is the ability to use fire. Naruto nodded as he saw Orochimaru use a fire jutsu. It was a small fire but Naruto was fascinated by the wavering flames of fire. He wanted to touch the fire to feel its warmth. Orochimaru slapped Naruto's hand away as Naruto's hand was a little too close to the fire. Naruto. The fire is very hot you can burn yourself. Orochimaru scolded the boy. It wasn't the first time Naruto did something wrong and was scolded by it. He learned to not cry about it as all the cry would do is make matters a lot worse. Anko decided to let her presence be known. Good morning sensei and Naruto-kun. She sat down right next to Naruto and ruffled his head as she watched her sensei work. Orochi smirked slightly as the fire fared. He said, Good morning, Anko-chan. I was just teaching Naruto here the basic elemental wheel. Now Naruto the element that beats fire is what? Naruto grew a thinking look on his face. Anko whispered something into his ear. He grew a big smile on his face. He said with excitement, Sweden. Orochimaru replied, That's correct Naruto even though Ms. Mitarashi did help answer the question. It takes much more ability to create the water than to manipulate what is already available and expel it from their mouths. Anko merely pouted as she huffed. Orochi did one hand sign and said, Sweden, Ishua, water style, water current, he drowned out the fire with water. The fire became smoke as the water moved all around. Orochi said, Okay Naruto since Anko wants to help, what is weak against? 
Once again Anko whispered something inaudible into Naruto's ears. Naruto said, it's Raiden. Orochi chuckled at the duo. He said, unfortunately the answer is actually Doden. Anko and the boy's eyes went wide. Anko asked, why is it Doden? Lightning naturally would use water as a conductor to enhance its ability. It would take water at least 1.5 times the amount to overcome lightning. Orochimaru was smirking up a storm. He liked that Anko was actually thinking about her answers to Naruto. She was a perfect student as she was willing to learn anything and could do anything with ease. He said, you are right but I want you to look at the Hokage mountain. The mountain is washed and cleaned with water. It takes time for water to destroy it. It can soak it up and hold it for a long time. Lightning is a little different. Yes, lightning can be effective against water. However with water, the lightning spreads. So if you create a water shield and a lightning attack comes at you, instead of a direct hit, the lightning will be spread to the sides. Of course it would break the shield but the lightning will not hit. Think of it like this, a spark can create a fire or full-blown energy. Orochimaru saw a big puddle or water where the fire was. He did a hand sign, and said, Doden, Manasugoi, earth release, earth shattering. Soon enough the earth shattered around the puddle. The puddle fell through the cracks of the shattered ground. Orochi said, you see what I mean? Anko and Naruto nodded slowly as the former understood much better than the latter. Orochi said, Doden has the ability to change the strength and composition of the earth from being as hard as metal to as soft as clay, as well as manipulating their density, making them heavier or lighter. Now since this is the case, what would be the weakness of Doden? Anko had to think about it. That's a hard one. Doden is the earth so what could it be? She was at a loss. However Naruto wasn't. He just yelled out, Raiden. Orochimaru stopped mid-step. Shock was evident on his pale face. He could not believe it. He wouldn't believe it. He asked with a slight hesitation, W what did you say? Naruto clapped his hands as he repeated, Tu san, it is Raiden. Nope, Orochimaru was not hearing things. He said, T that's correct Naruto-kun. Anko-chan I'm disappointed that you didn't get this one right. She huffed at her sensei as he continued. The reason is can easily travel through and break the ground apart. Raiden allows the user to generate lightning by increasing the high frequency vibrations of their chakra, allowing for piercing damage and fast movement. It does not move as fast as true lightning. Instead, due to the control the user has to exert over it, it moves far slower. What would that mean for the opponent, Anko Chan? Anko said without hesitation, it can give opponents time to still react. Just like Kakashi's Chidori, right? Naruto was confused. He didn't know what a Chidori was, or for that matter a Kakashi. So instead he just listened to see what he can find out. Orochi really didn't like talking about that boy but for this point in Raiden, he is necessary. Orochi commented, Kakashi is a different case altogether. He is able to quicken the lightning by a substantial amount. Normally a move like that would be an execution style when the opponent has no way of moving. The move itself is too straight. However the reason it became signature move was because of something terrible. Naruto was of course intrigued. He watched his father talk about this Kakashi character and his Chiori or whatever it is called. Anko said after digesting the info, what is so terrible about him that it actually gives him the advantage? Orochimaru said, the reason it is terrible or actually I would say deadly is because if he uses it too much he will die. He spelled it out for Naruto wouldn't catch on. Or so he hoped. Naruto's mind started to hurt because he had so many questions bottled up. He just had to know something. He said in his squeak-like voice, dry. What's a kashi and how will it dry? Orochimaru cracked a smile. The boy could be very smart and intelligent but sometimes you got to remember you were dealing with a two-year-old. He made a shadow clone and said, Naruto-kun, my clone here is going to teach you how to draw inside. Anko and I have some adult ninja stuff to talk about. Naruto had a visible pout on his face. He wanted to know what a Kakashi was and how it dried. He relented however as he probably was not going to get his answer. He said, okay tu san. Orochi smiled as he saw Naruto leave. He looked at his female apprentice and said, okay Anko-chan, you wanted to know about Kakashi. To be quite honest, his ability to use the Chidori is more of a consolation prize to what's going on. As you know he lost his eye in the war. She rolled her eyes as she replied, everyone knows that. I don't really see anything important about that. Orochimaru mentally frowned. Lately she has been more. Brash. 
She used to be so quiet and attentive but now she has gotten loud. Maybe it's because she has been around Naruto. Or vice versa. He sighed inwardly. Well Anko-chan, what you did not know is that he lost his teammate. His name was Obito Uchiha. Anko's eyes went wide. Her mouth had officially closed her mouth and listened to her sensei more intently. Let me tell you about the Sharingan. The Sharingan is a special eye as it has seven more optical nerves and visual cortex than any other eye. The optical nerves send the illusions and visions to the brain. With the Sharingan there are seven more of those. Three of them are created by the body. The other four are created by the chakra of the user. With these nerves one's perception and visualization is grown sevenfold. For this to work, there are spots on the tangents and cotangents of the eyes that must connect with these nerves. The four chakra induced ones do not activate until the Sharingan has been activated. Anko was surprised by this. She never knew about the extended detail of the Sharingan. Orochi continued, from what the reports say and that I confirmed for myself is that Obito Uchiha had in fact activated the Sharingan before he died. He sacrificed himself and more importantly his eye to his teammates. His other teammate Rin was a great medic. She with much reluctance took Obito's eye out perfectly. She took out the nerves from each spot. The problem came when she implanted Obito's eye into Kakashi's eye socket. To do the procedure, it takes a lot of time to get it just right. With the Sharingan it takes three times longer. In addition this was during a time of war. She has done the procedure before but this was different. She connected the wrong nerves into the wrong spots in the tangents. She didn't know about it at the time that she hooked the chakra ocular nerve into the blood tangent and the blood ocular nerve to the chakra tangent. The result is that with the chakra ocular nerve connected to the blood tangent the Sharingan can never be deactivated. The worst part is the blood nerve being connected to the chakra tangent. Due to the fact that the Sharingan cannot be deactivated, the chakra tangent is trying to absorb the chakra from the blood nerve. In doing this, it is taking chakra away from his body. The chakra does not return once absorbed. So basically he will die from having no chakra. Anko's eyes were wide. She thought, Orochimaru sensei, never tells everything but what changed. This is so unlike him. She said, sensei, why would you tell me everything? It is so so unlike you. Orochimaru smirked at his apprentice. That was the Anko he knew, the smart and the inquisitive Anko. He said, well Anko, there is one piece of advice I will give you. A dead body tells more than a living one. Anko was deep in thought about what her sensei said. However something felt wrong she quickly tried to pull out a kanai from her waist bag but it was too late. Orochi whispered in her ear, your body will be the perfect indicator along with the others. You will show me your true strength. His canine teeth grew into vipers as he bit the nape of Anko's neck. She started to convulse. She started to become feverish as her vision became blurry. On her neck a seal started to appear. It was almost like a tattoo. The last thing she said as Orochimaru lifted her up. Why Orochimaru sensei? Orochi is not one for miscalculation. Miscalculation of anything could result in death. However Orochimaru miscalculated his son's determination. Orochimaru took him inside the house but it was only a few kilometers away from the real Orochi and Anko. As Orochi's clone was teaching him drawing techniques, Naruto's ear was twitching. His hearing was amazing as he could hear from at most 300 kilometers away. So while Naruto was drawing he heard everything and it was buried deep into his head. No one could ever doubt how smart Orochimaru was, he knew how curious Naruto could be. Naruto had more than once been caught in Orochimaru's library. He caught Orochimaru off guard when he asked him about Fuenjutsu. Of course he didn't say the word correctly but Orochi knew what word he tried to say. Orochi had started to teach Naruto how to create seals by showing him how to draw. Naruto had shown great skills in drawing the seals. Orochimaru kind of hoped he would be great with seals especially with who his parents are. Naruto had finished his drawing. Orochi had his smirk on his face. Orochi said, very good Naruto. Now let's try. A month has passed and Naruto turned three. He has grown so much in his abilities. His drawings were a few steps away from being complete. Orochimaru has been teaching Naruto how to punch and kick. Now Naruto try this. Orochimaru did a sidekick into a tree. The tree broke in half. Naruto blinked his eyes as the tree fell down. He looked incredulously at his father. Tu san, I don't think I can, he pointed at the tree that was on the floor. Orochi had a small chuckle to himself. 
He kneeled down to the boy and patted his head. He said, Naruto, I don't plan on you breaking the tree. That is something you could do when you're older. For now I want you to practice the kick. I'll do it with you. He reassured the boy as the boy nodded. Naruto got into position as he counted to himself the numbers. Ready, go. Haya, he kicked the tree. The tree didn't have a dent in it. Naruto was disappointed as he knew he wasn't going to dent it. But he tried and tried again all in vain. Orochi saw that the kick was not gaining any power. He said, Naruto, put more strength on your kicking leg not on the back leg. Remember that leg is used to keep you up. Naruto nodded as he go into position. He put all of his concentration onto the twice as tall tree. He went for the kick with a, Haya, Naruto's kick was a good one. However his legs kept going up. His eyes went wide as he was losing balance in his back leg. Orochimaru looked at Naruto's form. He didn't expect Naruto to be like Maida guy. Even Maida had trouble with taijutsu when he was three. Maybe if I do a mini spar with him, I could probably see what he can do. He said, Naruto, that's good but you put too much concentration on the kick and not the balance. Naruto nodded as he got ready to kick the tree again. Naruto-kun, you're not going to hit the tree again. We're going to have a little competition. If you win you can have ramen. But if I win, we get my favorite food. Orochimaru realized how to get Naruto to do things, such as sparring with his whole heart, by the offer of ramen. Was it a good thing? To Orochi it got the job done. Naruto asked, Tu-san, what happened to Anko-chan? Every day since her disappearance, Naruto has been asking where she went. Orochi frowned as the thought of Naruto finding out might mess everything up. He said, Anko-chan is out on a mission by the Hokage. She should be back soon. Naruto just nodded although he felt something nagging in the back of his head. Orochi got into the hubby stance. As Naruto got into a miniature version of it. Orochi smiled as his adopted son tried to copy him. Orochi saw that the stance had many flaws but that was expected. He said, ready, get set, Hajime. Naruto ran towards Orochimaru. He threw a punch that Orochi blocked easily. Orochi threw a soft punch to Naruto. To Naruto however the punch came at the speed of light. He went into a panic and ducked. He followed up with a sweep kick. Orochimaru frowned as he allowed Naruto to kick him. He didn't move an inch. He grabbed the boy by the collar. He weakly threw him to the other side. Naruto panicked too early. He needs to calm down and follow through. Let's see how he does in the second round. Naruto got up and got into stance once again. He panted as the initial fear of facing him was gone. He didn't rush this time. Instead he picked up a kanai from the ground. He threw the kanai swiftly at the hubby Sanin. The speed of the kanai no longer surprised the Sanin. He knew it came faster than a kid of three could throw. He deflected it as Naruto ran towards him. I see you're trying to distract me. Naruto threw a punch. Unfortunately for Orochimaru, Naruto put all his strength into his fist, as he punched Orochimaru, in his testicles. Orochimaru's eyes went wide as everything went numb. He tried to squeal but his body went into shock as fell over, clutching his side. Naruto's eyes went wide. He won, he exclaimed, yes, I beat Tu San. Tu San went down to the ground. I'm getting free ramen. That was the last thing on Orochimaru's mind. Orochimaru has not been the same since that morning excursion. His hands have been constantly shaking as his hair was frayed. Naruto got his ramen at Orochimaru's expense. Right now Orochimaru had a visitor outside of the walls of Konoha. Now did you get the sample? Orochi asked with a slightly agitated voice. Orochimaru was not in the mood for failure. His slit eyes peered into his visitor's eye. The guy's body was visibly shaking as he felt the hubby Sanin's killer intent rise. He said, Orochimaru-sama, I, I got the sample. H here it is. He pulled out a vial of liquid. He lightly placed it into the hubby Sanin's hand. Orochimaru carefully inspected the vial. He didn't fully trust the guy but he wasn't going to deal with him. Dot yet. The man breathed easier as Orochi pocketed the vial. The man said, now how about the Uchiha and the Hayuga? I'll be here. No, no. What do you mean no? I got you the samples and everything and you tell me no. Who the hell do you think you are? Orochi calmly looked at the man who was basically foaming at the mouth. He said, I would like for you to keep your voice down or somebody might see you before it's time. Now it seems someone is being greedy. We agreed on the Hayuga. 
The Uchiha was not in the discussion or else the demand would have been much more. The man growled at the Habi Sanin. He said, fine, I'll trade you the male Hayuga for a male Uchiha. Orochi's eyes narrowed at the man. He did not like being put in a situation like this. He said, no can do. There is only a one-fourth chance that an Uchiha can produce and a one-sixteenth chance of a Sharingan child. Since I did not check the genetics of any of the Uchiha children. I'm pretty damn sure that you are not going to able to steal four Uchihas and a Hayuga. So I sincerely suggest that you cut your losses on the Uchiha. Now when are you scheduled to come for this, peace treaty, your cage came up with? The man had to reel himself in before he got himself killed. He said with anger lacing his words, I'll be here in two weeks. Orochi nodded as he said, Good I'll see you then. With that Orochimaru disappeared in a swirl of leaves leaving a furious visitor to fume. A week has gone by and Orochi was a patient man. He knew what he had, in his possession, was another piece to his ultimate chimera. The problem was did he want to finish it? He saw the effects of the last time but he knew that this was the last time. He didn't waste time bartering with a certain group for their genetics. Orochi had to find and create different things for almost every member in order to get the genetics. With that in his mind, he was going to do it. He was mulling over things when a cobra poofed into existence. The cobra's full length was a few inches taller than his summoner. He is a dull gold-colored cobra. He has five black and yellow stripes going down his back. Orochi recognized him instantly. He said, Kayo, how is the construction of the project going? The newly named Kayo said, Orochimaru-sama, the building is going along smoothly. In a few years it will be fully operational. We have many recruits helping out. It helps that they are so lively with music. You sure know how to pick them. Orochimaru grinned as his. Sighed. Project was working out well. That's excellent Kayo kun Now, how about the. Toy. Rooms. Orochi has been busy using his sanin rights. He has been setting up. Toy. Rooms all over Haino Kuni while the snake summons watched over Naruto. He asked the snakes to watch over his playhouses while he was in Konoha. Kayo said, Orochimaru sama, that is the reason I'm here. Someone has found Toy 4. Orochimaru's eyes narrowed at this. That toy room currently held his, Anko chan, and others. He snarled at the cobra as he spoke, who found it and why wasn't I told immediately? Tell me now. The cobra slightly coiled as Orochi's killing intent rose. He said, it was Konoha's Anbu. Hiruzen Serutobi was not known as the Shinobi no Kami for nothing. He had noticed some unusual things in the village hidden in the leaves. He has not heard anything from Jiraiya in a while. The last thing he had heard was that he was following this group that are supposedly targeting S-ranked ninjas to join them. He didn't know what to believe with that as there are only a few S-ranked ninjas in the world himself included and for a person or a group to actually gather them all together for one cause sounds downright impossible. However in a ninja world where people are able to manipulate the elements, anything is possible. He was going to put that in the back of his mind for now. The other problem has been Orochimaru and Naruto. His plan was to have Naruto become a Serutobi. However that could not happen unless by a small minuscule chance Orochi gave up on Naruto. That was the plan anyway, for Orochi being the perfectionist he is, to give up on an imperfect baby. Serutobi was wrong, dead wrong. Orochi has become possibly the perfect father. That is the part that is him. No one can be the perfect father. He had to have at least dropped the boy. Naruto has been downright polite, sincere, articulate for a child his age, and overall happy. For heaven's sake there was not even a hair out of place according to the doctor's report. This was not right and Serutobi knew it. He just could not prove it. The final thing on his mind was this peace treaty with Kumo. Kumo could be described as two things aggressive and cunning. They were the snakes that bit you when you were not around. He was not stupid. He was aware of their plans. He knew Kumo set this ploy up to possibly steal something more specifically someone. The question is always who. Then there was that purple-haired Jenin. She went missing a month or so ago. This was the tenth abduction in the last few months. She was supposedly on mission with her team. But the presiding Jonin said she wasn't even on the team. Although she was an orphan after the Kyubi attack, there were a few that actually cared for her well-being. His mind went a mile a minute as he had to be smart about this. 
If everything goes correctly he could avoid any unnecessary fighting, a peace treaty and a round of good lightning country smokes. That unfortunately could only happen in a perfect world. In a blur, a female Anbu member kneeled in front of his spacious office. He gained a stern look on his face as he said, report. The female stood up and bowed at her leader. She took off her mask, taking off the genjutsu that it activates when it is on. She said, Hokage-sama, we found someone has experimental lab that was not authorized by you or the daimyo of Haino Kuni. Hiruzen's eyes went wide as he quickly narrowed them. This was not something he wanted to happen at this particular time. His thoughts were grating his nerves as he looked at the woman. The female Anbu was five feet, seven inches tall. She had jade green eyes. Her most prominent feature is her hair. Her hair was a bright pink that went down the middle of her back. Her figure was more athletic with her bust being a medium B. Her face was more stoic as she watched her leader. The Sandame said in a serious tone, What did you find in this lab? Do not leave any details out. She could feel it. The Sandame's killing intent was rising quickly. She felt like suffocating as his old weary eyes had become stern and showed the power of the old man. She kept a calm demeanor as she spoke, Hokage-sama, Matim had found ten abducted ninjas in tubes. Nine are dead, the one who survived whatever had happened to them is the missing Genin Anko Mitarashi. She is merely unconscious. Serutobi's eyes were grim, the nine abducted people who died were actually the cream of the crop for the new generation. This was a major setback. Who would do this to these people? How did Anko survive? Maybe she would be the one that give them an indication of who it is. He said, Inu, Saru, Tora report. In an instant three Anbu members were on kneeling in front of the Hokage and the Anbu female. The two to the right looked exactly the same as the mask put a genjutsu over their appearance. The first person was a little odd looking. Although he is supposed to be an ordinary Anbu he is very, noticeable. He has gravity-defying silver hair. He is about 6 feet 3 inches tall. He wore a black t-shirt with the special Anbu vest with black pants. On his arm he had the Konoha version of the Anbu symbol. Hiruzen lit up his pipe. He pushed a button under the desk. When he touched the button a red barrier encircled the room. No sound or anything could be heard or shown outside of the barrier. He said, on this day, we will be conducting a task force. This is an s rank mission. As you know we will have a high member of Kumobaker no Sato coming to Konoha in a week's time. Kumo is a little shady because of their overly aggressive wants of bloodlines. Another problem is there was an illegal lab found. This lab has the 10 missing genin that we lost including one Anko Midarashi. She is the only one to have survived the ordeal. Too many variables and factors have clouded our picture. Your four squads are going to wash the picture's glass. Now this is how it will go. Tora, you and your squad are going to beef up the security around the borders. In addition you are going to the clan heads and make sure that they have security on all the children and clan heirs. This will last for three weeks. You are going to report to the commander after you are finished. Now Saru your squad's job is going to search the perimeter of Haino Kuni. I want your squad to find all unauthorized labs around. You do not and will not enter these labs. These labs are more than likely to be booby trapped. So if you find them mark it down and report it to your commander so we can send the appropriate team to the location. Finally Inu your task is the most dangerous. Inu looked at his leader with slight confusion. He replied, Hokage-sama, what is so dangerous about this mission? My group has Karasu, Neko, Ryu, and myself. We are a pretty powerful team with great teamwork. The Sandame took a puff of his pipe. He knew that Inu wasn't questioning his authority but merely the term he used to describe the mission. Rumor has it that this group took on a hundred me by themselves. But that's just a rumor after all. Hiruzen took another puff and said, Inu, your squad will have an S-ranked Rakan mission. An S-ranked Rakan mission has only been done three times in the history of Konoha. The mission cannot go wrong or else someone dies. This was serious and Inu knew it. Inu became quiet as he listened to the Hokage. Now Inu your job is the hardest. This mission becomes a failure not only will you but the whole squad will be charged with treason. So you must be swift and effective. Treason hit Inu and the pink-haired Anbu member hard. Inu gulped as he asked, Hokage-sama, what is the mission? 
The Hokage took a deep breath and sighed. He looked out into the window seeing the Hokage mountain and children playing. He said, Inu, your job is to infiltrate and steal all evidence in the house of Orochimaru. Orochimaru nearly lost his mind. Yes Orochimaru showed his anger for the first time in a long time. He literally threw a chair past three rooms shattering the chair in pieces. The cobra, Kayeo cowered under a table as Orochimaru destroyed most of the furniture in the room. It took Orochimaru 20 minutes to stop destroying the furniture. He panted as his now red eyes were fixated on the cobra. He said, how the did Anbu find it and why that son of is not six feet under. Kayeo could not breathe as he felt the killing intent of Orochimaru was suffocating him. He could barely even look the hubby Saninai to eye as he said, Orochimaru-sama, from what I was told, the group got lost after a disorientating fight and stumbled onto it. From what the snakes guarding the place said, the commander did a powerful fudenjutsu that kept them preoccupied. She was able to disable all the traps with ease. I have never seen anything like that in my life. Orochi's red eyes went wide as he thought of the Anbu who could do that. It took Orochi a moment until he realized who it was. He smashed the last piece of furniture into two pieces scaring Kayeo even more. He growled, that ing. Kayeo tell the other snakes to activate all the traps. I mean all of them. The next person who comes into the lab will be six feet under. Now I need to give Naruto the final syringe and take care of it. Damn it to hell Konoha is a problem and a ing half. All they do is make things worse and everything up. Especially that Haruno, he didn't know how right he was. During the week, the civilians have been decorated the village as the upcoming treaty would create an alliance with Kumo. The civilians were whispering and were absolutely giddy. The thought of upcoming business brought such joy. This was not the same sentiment of the shinobi of Konoha. It wasn't all that long ago that the third shinobi war was still going on. Kumo was an instigator to the tension of Iwa and Konoha. One of the rumors was that one of their premier Kumo Janin actually killed the Tsukikage's older daughter and it was said that the Yandaimi Hokage did it. But that's just a rumor. They did not trust Kumo one bit. The tension grew higher as each day came closer. Danzo was of course on edge. He knows Kumo was going to do something. He had some associations with Kumo in the past. They had a falling out 20 plus years ago when a trade fell through the cracks. The trade was supposed to be capturing of the Jinchuriki of Konoha in exchange for the two tails and eight tails. Kumo failed because of the future Yandaimi Hokage when he was at age eight. That was embarrassing for Kumogakur. However this did bring hope for the future shinobi in Konoha. Speaking of which, a flash appeared before Danzo. Danzo sat in his chair as his second in command was bowing down at him. Danzo said in his monotonous voice, Fukusho, how is Operation Adopt going? Operation Adopt has been in effect for three years. Danzo had delightedly surprised from what he has seen from it. They have gained of 700 children. One third of those children have bloodlines running through their veins. These children have been growing towards the way Danzo wanted them to be. Dot the perfect soldiers. The children were fed normal amounts of food but their toys were actually weapons. They were taught different things including fighting and that sort while the older children were grouped into twos and learned how to work together and how to survive with the essential teachings like cooking. Yes, Danzo's dream was coming true. Fukusho said, Danzo-sama, everything is going on full cylinders. The little seedlings are starting to develop. There is one however that has developed before time. His number is 1919. He has shown great skills in the art of sumijutsu ink techniques. He has made creatures at the tender age of three. He had even made on come to life for a whole minute. That is extraordinary for a child especially at three. Hearing Fukushu's inner giddiness about this group, Danzo smiled inwardly as he said, the new age of root is here. Naruto had awakened with immense pain. He never felt pain like this in his life. He screamed as his tears fell freely. He tried to get up to go to his father's room but the pain, a surge of lightning, went through the Naruto's body. He screamed out in pain and fear, Tu San. Help, please. Orochimaru did not sleep. He learned from a young age during the wars that sleep was the enemy. Orochimaru simply meditated. However since he had Naruto with him, meditating has become even more of a problem. With his sensitive ears, 
he could hear Naruto's whimpers especially when Orochi injected the pathogens into his system. He sighed as his mind wandered after injecting Naruto with that final pathogen. His ear twitched. He heard that scream only once. He quickly jumped up. The last time Naruto screamed it was the pathogen before this one where he convulsed and almost died. He didn't know what was going on or what was going to happen. As Naruto convulsed on the floor as lightning formed around him. As the lightning went through the floor into the electrical outlets, causing the house's lights to fare off and on he tried to utter some coherent words but his body stopped him. Orochi quickly tried to open the door. However when he touched the doorknob, his body was shocked with enough volts to kill a small animal. He pulled his hand back as shocks went through his body. He gritted his teeth as he kicked the door open. What Orochimaru saw made his heart stop. There he was, Naruto the Kyubi Jinchuriki, laying on the floor unconscious with lightning and energy flowing through him to every part of his room. As the lightning hit from one place to another, it looked like a light show that Orochi didn't want any part of. He yelled, Naruto, are you okay? Speak to me, he tried to get close to the boy. Boom, a thread of blue lightning struck Orochimaru deep into his chest. Orochi was thrown back into the wall as he clutched his chest. He opened his eyes and saw Naruto convulsing as the lightning show was destroying the room. His thoughts were scrambled as the pain went through his body, from his toes all the way to his fingertips. What have done? I've got to reach him but how? I need some type of an insulator. Damn, I need some type of rubber suit. I could get the one in the lab but it might be too late. I could throw myself up but the pain will still be there. Wait a minute, the angular projection of the lightning never hits the floor. I got it. Orochi was not stupid. This is why he is considered one of the best shinobi alive. He did the a few hand signs and slammed his hand to the ground and said, Kuchio's no jutsu. In a puff of smoke a snake appeared. It was ten feet long head to tail. His was a cobalt blue with yellow stripes going along its back. He has blue and yellow slit eyes. He had a large horn on the top of his head. Orochimaru wheezed out with pain going through his lungs. Rakuranio, I need you to conduct the lightning into your horn. The newly named Rakuranio said, Orochimaru-sama, as much as I would love to take up all the electricity as it would be a delicious snack, ZZZP asterisk taking all of that electricity would asterisk ZZZP asterisk kill young Naruto. That is not normal asterisk ZZZP asterisk lightning or electricity. This is not chakra asterisk ZZZP asterisk laced. I've never seen asterisk ZZZP asterisk like this before. It's like the lightning is natural asterisk ZZZP asterisk but Naruto had somehow is bending it to his will asterisk ZZZP asterisk but it went terribly wrong asterisk ZZZP asterisk. I can deflect the chakra enough to allow you suppress Naruto's chakra control. Once you do that asterisk ZZZP asterisk I could absorb my snack. Orochi eyes were wide from Rakuranio's explanation. He couldn't really comment as did a certain hand sign. On his hands were five kanji symbols. The first is the kanji sign for metal. The second one is the symbol for wood. The third one is the symbol for water. The fourth one is the symbol for fire. The final one is the symbol for earth. He said, I am ready, whenever you are, Rakuranio. The snake nodded as it quickly took hold of the lightning charge. Soon all the electricity was focused on Rakuranio. This was as painful as it could get for the snake as its purpose was to eat the electricity not absorb and deflect. It was like letting the prey beat up the predator. He hissed at Orochimaru as the lightning was going through his body unnaturally, what are you asterisk zzzp asterisk waiting for? Go get the boy and stop him asterisk zzzp asterisk before I become ashes. Orochimaru was a little frozen. To him he saw not one but two individuals he held in high regard were dying. He never froze up like this before and didn't like it at all. He felt useless. It was not until Rakuranio yelled at him to realize that he had to do something. He rushed towards the boy and flipped him over. He could see even with Naruto's eyes wide open that Naruto was deeply unconscious and had a great possibility of dying. He heard Naruto whisper with life knocking on death's door, help me too San. He did what he had to do. With much regret he said, Sorry about this Naruto but this is the only way, Gogyo Fuin, five elemental seal. He pressed the five symbols onto Naruto's stomach. Rakuranio's body started to feel the heat coursing through his body. 
He shuddered as he knew if Orochi doesn't do something quick he would be done for. He closed his slit at his eyes as he could feel the lightning gaining momentum over his body. Here it was his end. He closed his eyes tighter as he waited for the kill. Nothing. He opened his eyes to see the lightning had become wild. He smirked as his body was slightly charred. He saw the lightning just waiting to be eaten as he drew the lightning sparks to himself and ate it. His body started to have a charge with a smile on his face. He ate his lips with satisfaction. He looked over to see the boy and concerned washed over him. He said, Orochi-sama, how is young asterisk ZZZP asterisk Naruto doing? Orochi was not quiet but silent. He didn't know what to really say. Naruto has a 85% chance of living. The lightning that was surging through him did not zap all of his chakra. That in itself scared Orochimaru as that means it has two explanations. The first is that Naruto has the possibility of having way too much chakra. It is possible to have more than a chunin. That is too scary of thought that a three year could have that much chakra flowing through him. Yet the second thought is actually worse. Orochi didn't feel it but he couldn't be sure that the Kyubi's chakra is flowing through Naruto's core chakra system. If that is the case then Naruto will become a ticking time bomb. He could even be the poster boy for what happens when abused children grow up to be. The thoughts clouded his mind as he felt something tugging on him. Rakurenio heard nothing from Orochi. So he decided to slither to the hubby Sanin. He tugged onto his sleeve as Orochi went into a mental shock. He was still not responding so Rakurenio took it upon himself to give Orochi a little bit of shock therapy. He bit Orochi's ankle sending a few volts through his body. Orochi's eyes went wide as he felt the voltage go up and down his body. It was not nearly enough to kill or do permanent damage but it still gave the hubby Sanin a jolt. He looked down and saw Rakurenio positive and negative charged vipers still out. Rakurenio said to the hubby Sanin as he retracted his vipers, Are you okay Orochimaru-sama? You zoned out asterisk ZZZP asterisk on me less than a few moments asterisk ZZZP asterisk after the battle. Orochi looked at the snake with his yellow weary eyes. The snake felt empathy for the man as he sighed. Orochi said with a dead tone, None of this should have happened, Rakurenio. The plan had been to build this boy up, and then I could simply take his body. B but it went wrong. Everything went ing wrong. The frustration has caught up with Orochimaru and Rakurenio knew it. Although Rakurenio is young in some in years, he has been with Orochimaru for 20 years. Rakurenio has been through it all with Orochimaru. He said in a calm voice, Orochi-sama, you don't get it. Of course this plan was going to have setbacks that would cripple it. Personally I thought the plan would fail because of the fact that most people would have died with one bloodline reaction. Naruto is truly remarkable in that aspect. Now the other aspect is what has been the human aspect. What has been lost on you is love. Ever since what happened to Ophelia. Don't you bring her into this. Orochi snarled as his fists shook from visible Rakurenio anger. Rakurenio was not afraid of Orochi by any means. He had nerves of titanium. He was calm as he spoke, Orochi, don't be so asterisk ZZZP asterisk haste. This is about 35% about asterisk ZZZP asterisk Ophelia. In fact, that is why you came up with this asterisk ZZZP asterisk concoction of a plan. You know asterisk ZZZP asterisk it and I know it. Ever since the incident, ZZZP you have lost the ability to love. You have become cold and that's coming from a asterisk ZZZP asterisk cold blooded summon. You have always been manipulative, ZZZP asterisk I'll give you that but the scientific degrading of human life has become asterisk ZZZP asterisk appalling. You were experimenting with people's asterisk ZZZP asterisk lives. Naruto is a different case asterisk ZZZP asterisk altogether. You raised him like he was your very own. He has a personality that is like a asterisk ZZZP asterisk magnetic attraction. He has something about him that brings people, animals, ZZZP asterisk even summons to him. He even melted your heart. So tell me did you plan asterisk ZZZP asterisk on that? Naruto was the X factor. Orochi was not calmed by this as Rakurenio was right. He didn't calculate Naruto the human factor. That was one variable that has quite possibly destroyed his plans. He said with Venom getting stronger with each passing word, 
So Rakuranio if this is the case, then what does Ophelia have to do with it? Huh, you are just as bad as the others. Everyone always wants to bring up things that do not need to be there. Rakuranio was not surprised by Orochi's demeanor. His ice-cold demeanor was cracking and he needed to push it just a little further. Orochi, you don't remember asterisk ZZZP asterisk do you? You forgot what your inspiration for this whole plan was. Your plan is to be all-powerful and immortal. That's true, however you wanted to be immortal to keep researching. Shut up, just shut up, I don't need this right now. If you want to help things then help me bring Naruto into the chamber. I'm going to conduct a series of tests on the boy to see how his body is holding up. We will not discuss this ever again. Do you understand, Rakuranio? Rakuranio looked at the mentally weakened Orochimaru with pity. He couldn't get him to break yet but this is an excellent start. He thought, with all those scars in his soul, he needs to have closure. Wait a minute, talking about scars, that energy should have at least gave Naruto a dozen wounds. Yet he doesn't have a single scratch on him. He said, Orochi-sama, there's something wrong. Really, really wrong. Orochi really didn't want to talk yet he needed to know if there is anything wrong. He sneered. What is wrong now Rakuranio? Rakuranio rolled his eyes at Orochimaru. The hubby Sanin was not in the mood, but Rakuranio didn't care. He knew this was more important than Orochimaru's mental disarray. He said, Orochi-sama, the energy that was emitted by Naruto is quite troublesome. You see although Naruto's body was emitting it, he had no such control. This means it is on its own. Orochimaru nodded at this but really didn't see any problem other than lack of control. He asked quizzically, okay so he couldn't control the lightning. I didn't expect him to but what does have to do with anything? Rakuranio knew that Orochi was not catching on so he replied, think about it. What happens when lightning hits metal or even a tree? The lightning would leave scorch marks. Now look at the walls there are scorch marks all over the place. Along with that have you ever seen a light bulb that is blown because of too much voltage? Orochimaru snapped, what's the point? You're not making any sense. Orochi was still not understanding what the blue and yellow snake was talking about. The snake sighed as he continued, Orochi you gotta think. If Naruto's body couldn't control the lightning, then why the hell does he not have any scorch marks or burns anywhere on his body? He didn't have any cuts or anything like that. Orochi stopped in midstride as his eyes went wide. He could only utter, oh my kami. The rest of the night was calm for Orochi. Orochi was still in his lab watching the young boy with a mask on floating in a tube with a green liquid. It seems that the boy is in a medically induced state of unconsciousness. He already determined that Naruto was going to be in there for a week's time. As Naruto floated, Rakuranio decided to watch as he like most of the snake summons have grown attached to the boy. The only one who doesn't like him all that much was Manda but didn't like almost anyone. He barely tolerates Orochimaru. This boy has caused a conflict of interest. The snakes considered Naruto the next heir of the snake summons. He would be the perfect candidate. He was fun and looked naturally harmless but he is high deceptive and will catch anyone off guard. He is actually quite the charmer. Rakuranio sighed as he saw the possible catalyst to the restoration of separation of the summons, floating in the green tube. There has been a resistance brewing among the snake summons. Manda and his followers have become darker in their way of thinking and actions. They have started to go the old way of thinking making the snake summons look like evil deceptive creatures that represent all that is wrong with the world. This is causing a rift in their world and they hope he can fix it. He could only sigh as he looked at Summoner. He asked, Orochimaru-sama, what are the tests indicating? Orochimaru had been conducting tests since the event. Naruto's diagnostics were showing normal numbers. His bones were perfectly intact. In fact, they were stronger. It was normal as he was still growing for his bones to be sturdy. However his bone development increased dramatically. It was worrisome but Orochi had to keep calm. He said, Rakuranio, there are a lot of abnormalities with the boy. Some of these abnormalities have been here since the beginning like having perfect vision, mind capacity, being able to hear a mile away, his ability to sniff out anything, even his chakra levels. Tonight his tests showed even more abnormalities. His bones are much denser than before, his body is more flexible, 
his chakra control is almost pinpoint without training it, and the biggest abnormality is the rapid regeneration. Rapid regeneration is a double-edged sword. Cells naturally regenerate but not this quickly. It basically like layaway. With rapid regeneration one cells come back almost as quickly as that cell left. However because of how quick he regenerates, he is killing the cell's life at a much quicker rate. So for example if hypothetically his lifespan originally was 80 years, if he keeps regenerating at this rate it could cut it down to 60 years. That is a 20 year drop off. But Naruto's genealogy has changed that possibly. The Uzumakis live long lives. Some Uzumakis have reached the age of 160. With that being the case losing 20 years would mean he could live up to 140 years. That is the best case scenario with the 20 year problem. The second problem deals with what I injected into him. It is the Mokudan genes. The genes slow down the cell's life almost to a crawl. This is done by the force of nature's chakra. That particular chakra can overtake the cells and keeps it going. What is interesting is that Naruto should not be able to naturally gain this ability unless he is a direct descendant of the Shodai. Hem this is quite interesting. As Orochimaru was rambling to himself, Rakurenio was skeptical about the Mokudan. He asked, Orochimaru-sama, can you explain how you can tell that from Naruto being in a tube? It doesn't make much sense. Orochi saw the skepticism on Rakurenio's face. It was natural as anyone could throw out different terminology and it doesn't make much sense. Orochi pulled out Naruto's lab results and showed it to him. He said, you see I took a sample of Naruto's blood. I tested it by putting a drop under the microscope. When compared to not one but 1000 samples, I was able to tell how much oxygen and other things are in the cell. As to the nature's chakra, I was able to place some into a few cells not of Naruto's. With the variety of the samples I was able to conclude that nature chakra can make a cell to live up to 400 years. That is of course without a person getting injured. So along with Naruto's genes and nature's chakra the rapid regeneration becomes a plus then a minus. Rakurenio could only blink at this, scientist. He didn't understand the explanation and at this point he didn't want to. He said, okay, Orochimaru-sama, if you say asterisk zzzp asterisk so. I don't get asterisk zzzp asterisk how you got this but asterisk zzzp asterisk as long as Naruto is fine, then everything is swell. In a matter of seconds, Rakurenio went disappeared in a puff of smoke. Orochimaru knew that Rakurenio was extremely tired and was going to pop at any moment. When he left however Orochimaru for the first time since gaining custody of Naruto that he, felt alone. The overwhelming sadness and depression had caught him. He bowed his head, if one looked close enough he or she could see a few droplets fall from his pale white face. He mumbled as sleep overcame him, Ophelia. Four days have passed and Orochimaru has not been the same. He had started to become mentally unstable since Naruto was in the tube, Ophelia came back to mind, and his departure from Konoha. In addition, Orochimaru had a problem and a half. As he looked around at the ever-growing tension, he realized today was the day of the Konoha Kumo Treaty. He sighed loudly as he got up from his lab chair and tapped the tube with Naruto in it. He knew these would be the memories he will remember forever. It didn't matter if Naruto wasn't his biological son or not, will always be his son. With that resolve Orochi went into his library. He was going to make sure Naruto would not stop learning even when he was gone. My son is going to be the best I'll be damned if any tries to stop him. Other than me of course. Kukuku. It's time, Inu thought to himself. His squad had hidden themselves in trees near the house of Orochimaru. He sighed as this was not the mission he particularly liked. But if the Sandame wanted him to do it then he will. He whispered to Neko, what do you see in Orochimaru's house? Neko was about 5 feet, 8 inches tall. Her face was a little narrow. Her body is curved like an hourglass with a small C cup. She has long purple hair. She was about 14 years old. On her back was a slim sword. She used her binoculars to look into the house. She said, Buntecho, I don't see him anywhere. It seems like he has left for some reason. I didn't see him leave the house but he's out of range. This made Inu frown deeply. Right now Orochimaru was a variable that can't seem to remain constant. He said, Ryu, use your teleportation ability to assess the situation better. 
Ryu nodded. Ryu was about 5 feet 11 inches tall. He had short brown hair. His face was pointy. He is wearing a long-sleeved, dark hunter green and black t-shirt along with a black flak jacket. His pants were black with seals on the sides. On his back he has a slightly curved katana hidden in a sleek sheath. His mask was a dragon with beady, jet black eyes. In an instant, he disappeared into thin air. This is why Inu liked this group. Their abilities worked so well with each other. He smirked under his mask as he watched Ryu dart from each side of the house. He returned in a few seconds. He said, Buntecho, there is no indication of Orochimaru. It seems that you chose the right day to do this. It seems like there is an entrance at the southeast side. Inu nodded as he analyzed the information. He did not like putting his team in a situation where there are too many variables. He sighed as he analyzed the house carefully. Sure he and his team were going to in the southeast side it was still problematic, if caught. He said, Karasu, I want you to put a rotating genjutsu around the southeast entrance. If necessary you could put a third layer. Karasu is about 5 feet, 6 inches tall. He has black hair that hung near his cheeks to frame his face and kept the rest of it in a ponytail. He wears a black and gray armor, metal arm guards and gloves, ninja sandals with spikes, three ninja pouches on their back waist. He has a black long sleeve shirt on that covers his Konoha spiral tattoo. He has jet black eyes. His mask is a weasel. Karasu closed his eyes as he said, Buntecho, do you think that he could possibly set up this backdoor entrance for intruders? It seems extremely suspicious that he has another entrance other than the front door and the back door. Inu's eyes went wide, he face palmed as he felt stupid. Karasu was right, how could he forget about the aspect of traps? He sighed as he no other choice. The Sandane was going to nail Kumo and Orochimaru today. He just needed the proof. He sighed as he said, Karasu's right. How do we know? Well we are going to have to see for ourselves. Let's go. With that the Anbu squad embarked on the quest into Orochimaru's house. Hiyashi-kun, brighten up. Today's Hanada's third birthday, Harini said to her husband as he sighed. Yes, it just so happened to be Hanada Hayuga's birthday. He had become stoic after three years of hearing from Shinobi Council to civilian council members, hell even the Hayuga Council members, about arranging a marriage to his little daughter. Even one was so bold as to demand his signature to wed her. Well that particular gentleman has not been seen in Haino Kuni since then or for that matter anywhere else. He rubbed his temples as his pregnant wife draped her slender arms over his shoulders around his neck. Harini ed him softly on the cheek as he sighed. He smiled slightly as he saw his little girl growing up. Harini-chan, you know it's hard to believe that Hinata-chan is three years old already. I could have sworn that I would have lost my mind by the time she turned three. He joked wryly. She giggled at her husband's dry joke. She slapped him slightly on his arm. She said, hiyashi kum, you can't go crazy as long as I'm here. He smirked as he hugged his impregnate wife closer to him. H. He said, it's hard to believe that Heen Kun is nine years old and is a genin already. He is the pride of the Hyuga clan. She giggled slightly as Hiyashi was proclaiming that his son was the best of the new crop. She said, Hiyashi Kun, Hizashi Kun's son, Neji has been shown to be very adept to gentle fist. Hiyashi scoffed at his wife as he laughed. He said, Hizashi's son is a weak, just like his daddy. He should Hein's feet for that matter. She laughed at her husband's arrogance. She said, I hope he doesn't get a big head like you did when you graduated with Minato Sama. The normally conservative Hiyashi became flustered. That particular class was considered the best crop of ninjas to exist since the time of the Sandame and Donzos. The class contained Minato Namikaze, Fugaku Uchiha, Hiyashi Hayuga, Hizashi Hayuga, Harini Hayuga, Shikaku Nara, Choza Akamichi, Inoichi Yamanaka. Yoshino Nara, Kashina Uzumaki, and Sum Inazuka. During that time each student in the class graduated at the age of 10. This particular class made the Rookie of the Year award so prominent. It was a four-way battle between Minato, Kashina, Fugaku, and of course Hiyashi. At the end it became a draw between Minato, Hiyashi and Kashina. They decided that this would be the first time that there would be a triumvirate for the title. Minato became the leader of Squad 7 under the tutelage of Jiraiya. 
Hiyashi became the leader of Team 8 under the tutelage of Sakumo Hitaki. Kashina became the leader of Team 6 under the tutelage of Tsunade. He smiled at the memories of the rowdy Soom, the quiet Minato, the loud-mouthed Kashina, the red-faced shy girl who kept touching her fingers together, also known as his wife. He said, You know beautiful, we were pretty amazing in our day. I think this generation is going to be good this year. She ed him on the cheek as she let out a joyous sigh. She said, Who knows? They might be better than us. Now Hiyashi-kun, it's time to actually get out of this bed and get ready for the party. Hiyashi laughed as his wife giggled. He said, You know what Harini-chan, I love you and the kids. I don't think anything can ruin an amazing day like this. Unfortunately Hiyashi didn't know how wrong he was. The man of the hour had finally arrived. As he signed his name onto the sign-in sheet, one of the ninja guards alerted the Hokage and councils of his arrival. The ninja guard read the man's name his eyes narrowed. This was the same man that basically ended his ninja career. The man said to the guard, I remember you. Yeah, yeah, you're Hitoshi. How is that spine of yours? He sneered at the man as four members of the Anbu landed around the man. The man put his hands up as the Anbu members searched him from head to toe. As they searched for weapons and other destructive tools, they did not realize his most destructive tool was his mind. Hitonus was a deceitful human being and an extremely powerful politician. When he used to be an active ninja, he had become one step away from being the rakage. But he digressed. After the pad down, the main Anbu said, Hitonus Dono, before the festivities can begin, the Shinobi Council would like to begin the meeting now. Then afterwards you can have the celebrations. Hitonus nodded as he was escorted to the Hokage Tower. He turned his head back to the guard. With a sick sinister grin he said, Hitoshi-san, I hope that Kumo can have Konoha's backing after this. Before Hitoshi could move Anbu disappeared in a swirl of leaves, leaving the man to brew with hatred. Orochimaru was dressed in his formal robe. He sighed as he hated formal attire especially when it had the, hubby sanim, seal on the back. It went against the style of the snake. As he looked in the mirror he could feel a ghost-like feeling running up his spine. He sighed as he thought about the boy who became his adopted son. He knew he was about to leave him to the wolves and savages of Konoha. He wanted to take Naruto with him but it had way too many risks involved. Orochimaru-sama, we have checked on Naruto-kun, a familiar voice said. His voice sounded sullen. Orochimaru turned to see Naruto's, bestest friend, as Naruto would call him. Orochimaru could see it in the snake's eye. It was cold. It was anger. It was disappointment. He said, Orenji, what is his condition? Orenji's neck snapped up. His slit eyes became even narrower. He hissed as he said, other than being in a tube with green liquid, he is nice and dandy. His stats are fine. He should be able to come out of there tonight. Orochi scowled at Orenji's tone but disregarded it for now. He said, good now I have one more task. I need you to guard Naruto today. Hitonis has arrived from Kumogakur and I have to represent the three Sanin. The orange snake rolled his eyes as hissed something under his breath. He silently slid his way back to Naruto. Orochi's anger tripled as he balled his fists tightly. He didn't need this attitude of Orenji to know that he messed up. With the thought of Ophelia and Naruto fresh into his mind he punched the six-foot dressing mirror. As it shattered Orochi noticed the facade that he portrayed freely fall to the ground. Here it was, the hubby Sanim, the great inventor, one of the greatest tag team member, was alone and broken. With this last thought he disappeared into a swirl of leaves. Orenji slithered to the tube that contained Naruto. Unbeknownst to Orochi, a large amount of the group had started to rebel from Orochi and the contract. The upcoming war between Manda and his brother Yamada was growing. Most of the snakes are actually on Yamada's side. They want Naruto as the new summoner. Orenji's mission is to watch over him in secret. He will be his unofficial guardian. He was given the command that if Orochi even tries something on Naruto anymore he was given the right to strike and subdue the man. If it comes to a lethal battle, he was given the green light to take him out. Orenji sighed as he watched the boy floating with the simple thought going through his mind. Naruto. It took a few moments until the greatest peace treaty of all time to occur. The shinobi council wasn't as thrilled as the civilians outside were. The Hokage, 
Hitonis, and the Shinobi Council were escorted to the guest conference room of the Hokage Tower. As they were all seated in the conference, the Hokage gave Hitonis a pipe and lit it for him. The Hokage said, Welcome Shinobi Council and Hitonis san Today is a great day. It is an honor for Konoha to welcome one of the highest ranking members of Kumovikar. Today is not a day of war but a day for peace, an olive branch that Kumo graciously offered. With this it is my pleasure to let Hitonis san begin the treaty discussions. Hitonis stood up and bowed to the council. He said, it is a privilege to meet you here. It is even better as this meeting is for the peace between two of the greatest nations. Hitonis pulled out a scroll from his pocket. He opened the scroll and continued speaking. Kumo would like to begin the peace treaty with the MAD or the Mutually Assured Destruction Discussion. As you know we have two Jinchuriki, Nibi and Hachibi. We know that you have the strongest one in the Kayubi. To ensure out treaty we would like for two things to happen. The first is that we mutually agree that in any future wars we will not use the Jinchuriki as weapons against each other. Hiruzen and the Shinobi Council were in deep thought about this proposal. Hiyashi said, You know Hidonis san, I must ask out of pure curiosity, why is it that we are talking about supposed future wars? It seems a little suspicious that you bring up wars at a peace treaty. Hitonis growled inwardly at Hiyashi Hayuga. However in an instant the growl grew into a sinister smirk. He was going to enjoy taking some of those unmarked Hayuga children from them. His partner in crime, who sat on the opposite side of him, was a smirking up a storm. Well Hitonis kun let's see your bread and butter at work. Hitonis said in a calm demeanor, you bring up an interesting point in the matter of war talk in peace treaty. I brought this up because of a peace treaty that was broken a few years ago, when Takigakur attacked us. They used the Nanabi as leverage against us. We were able to defeat them but lost a lot of ninjas. We do not want the small innocent non-ninja countries around us to be destroyed. Hiruzen saw some valid points but something didn't seem right. Why was it that his spies in Kumo were not able to tell him about the conflict with Taki? In fact, none of his countries knew other than Kumo and Taki. Hiruzen said, Hitonis san, it has occurred to me, that no one has heard any incidents about Taki attacking Kumogakur. For the members of Taki to even summon Nanabi, many countries would be able to feel that power. Hitonis' eyes went wide for the briefest of seconds. This went unnoticed except for four people, Hiyashi, Fugaku, Hiruzen and Orochimaru. He said, well Hokage dono, they did not release the Nanabi but merely the Jinchuriki. Hiruzen could see what the man was implying and saw Orochi looking a tad bit angry at the implication. Orochi in his ever calm voice said, so Hitonis san are you implying that a Jinchuriki is not a human? I mean maybe one day your child might become a Jinchuriki. Would that mean that he or she is not a human? Would that mean that since your spawn is a Jinchuriki that makes you or wife a human being? If not then do not treat them like spawns. Hitonis was taken aback to this. He heard the laced irritation and anger in Orochi's voice. He had to watch himself or else the whole plan might go to hell. At Orochimaru's house, the Anbu squad was at the door. Inu said, Cat, do you have any way of opening this door? I would do it the old-fashioned way but it would be too much of a liability. Nako nodded at his way of thinking. She pulled something out of her hair. It looked like a regular hair clip but when she touched the small butterfly icon on the clip it changed into a key-like object. She put it in the keyhole. With a press of the butterfly icon, she unlocked it. Inu blinked as he asked sarcastically, do I even want to know what that is? She smirked as she chirped, it's a girl thing. Their captain just rolled his eyes. His keen sense of smell told him not to move just yet. He said, guys do you smell that? It smells like there is a poisonous gas behind the door. Ryu use your futon to clear out the poison gas. I'll kick the door open while you use your jutsu. Ryu nodded as he started to do five quick hands. Inu whispered, ready, get set now. In an instant he kicked the door releasing a purple and yellow gas. The others quickly jumped out of the way as Ryu said, futon, kihaku, wind release, thin air. Unfortunately for Ryu the gas got to him a split second before the move was used. Inu saw that the gas disappeared but Ryu was on the ground. Inu cursed as he and his team circled around Ryu. Inu checked his pulse and saw a faint pulse. He said with an edge to his voice, 
Nako create a cage bushin and bring Ryu to the hospital ASAP. He has a low heartbeat and doesn't have oxygen going through. She nodded vigorously as her shadow clone to Ryu to the hospital in a swirl of leaves. He sighed as he didn't like where this mission was going already. Karasu said, Buntecho, what's the plan action of action? Karasasu had been in the Anbu for a few years and had earned his stripes. He became second in command of this squad by the request of Inu. He noticed that Inu stood a little straighter as Inu walked past him. He said in a serious voice, we're going to investigate the house of Orochimaru. Orochimaru's basement was actually his lab. He broke his basement into two different sections. The first was nicely furnished with a fireplace, bed and the works. The second side however was different. It was cold, dark gray, with a murky demeanor Inu never seen anything like it. Upon further inspection, Inu saw vials of different shapes and colors, beakers, different high-tech machinery, even a stove. Nako whispered, what the hell is this place? Inu nodded with a grim look on his face. He said as they got in closer with fear going up their spines, Nako can, I believe we are going to find out more about Orochimaru than we really want to. Nako go east and look for anything that seems suspicious or of great importance. Karasu, you are to look west. I'm pretty sure he has files over there. When I used to shadow him I noticed that he used to put the file to the right. I'm going to go straight. Guys this is serious. We have already lost Ryu for the rest of the mission. This is the most dangerous part. Remember the rule, be alarmed, be armed. They both replied, hi. Nako and Karasu went there respectively as Inu walked forward. Inu being honest with himself was gravely afraid of what he might see. From what he had heard from Anbu member Saru they found some labs that were absolutely disgusting. There were molding and decaying human bodies, half-eaten rats, even a human body with a tail. Inu had to stop there as he was getting sick. He stopped his train of thought only to look up. He took a step back and fell. He barely whispered, oh my Kami, no. There he was, Naruto Uzumaki floating in a green watered tube. A voice echoed off the wall, so you are the one opened the basement door and invaded his house. The treaty went well for both sides. Konoha was able to wiggle a few moves in which Kumo would have to admit to and pay for the situation that happened with Kashina. In addition, they will send over one-fourth of their lightning jutsus and kenjutsus. Konoha would give up one-sixteenth amount of fire jutsus to Kumo. Each side will come to the other's aid even in border patrol. All that needs to be done is Hitonus going back to the wreckage and him signing it or ratifying it. Right now Hitonus was at the parade of, his, and Kumo's honor. Meanwhile his partner Orochimaru had more pressing matters. He was completing his part of the deal getting a Hyuga. Orochi was smart, that was always known but today he felt smarter than normal. He was invited to Hinata Hayuga's third birthday celebration. He saw the Akamichi, Nara, Yamanaka, Uchiha, Serutobi, Inazuka, and Abarame clan leaders and their immediate family. He also saw a few financially powerful civilians. He smirked as he watched the children play with each other and the adults conversing with each other with sake. Before the party started he spiked the drinks with his special liquid he had been working on. This liquid is his, genjutsu in a bottle. The drink when mixed with alcohol, gives the drinker a sense of obliviousness. This would dim the Hyuga's 359 degree vision, while making the Uchiha's Sharingan very cloudy. In addition this concoction dimmed the buzzing Abarame bugs, while dimming the Inazuka's senses. Oh those poor people keep drinking without thinking about what's in the drink. Ooh that rhymes. Well in a few minutes, they'll be out of commission. The two cage bushins should be able to do a switcheroo with the Hyuga princess. Yup, Orochimaru's plan was put into action as he went to chat with the leaders with his red fruit punch. Inu had finally freaked out. He saw Naruto floating in a tube and the echoing voice was really getting to him. He heard something slither towards him. It was an orange snake. It scared him as the snake was coming closer to him. Inu pulled a kanai out of his pocket and threw it at him. The kanai coming out of his hand was about 95 mile per hour. However right in front of his eyes, the orange snake snagged the kanai out of the air with his tail. The snake then fed it into a wall as Inu's eyes became wider. Orenji looked deep into the eyes of Inu. The serious look of the orange snake sent chills through Inu's body. 
Orenji asked. Now Anbu-san, I must ask how did you get in here? Better yet why are you even here? Inu was scared out of his wits. Not many people knows that Inu hates snakes. When he was about five a poisonous snake bit him and he was hospitalized for three months. He asked. W what are you doing here, snake Tem? The orange snake simple snapped his tail in a whip-like snap. He said as he peered into Inu's eyes, You know Anbu-san, it is not polite to not tell someone your name. That is entirely my fault however, for which I am sorry. My name Anbu-san, is Orenji. I can sense the fear of snakes rolling off like a rock on a hill. Since you are a scared chicken, I'm going to ask you again. Why are you here and how did you get in here? Inu tried to muster up some courage after that, chicken, insult. Well Orenji-san, I'm here to put your master in jail for what he has done to many people especially, Naruto-kun. Orenji chuckled at the silver-head Anbu member. He said, you know Anbu-san I would hope that you never get into politics. You are straightforward but a little too straight. But that is irrelevant at this point and time. So Anbu-san do you honestly think you can go and get past me without dying? Inu gulped as he nodded. Orenji smirked as he said, good. Even though I can basically eat the fear you emitting, I can see some strength coming through. Now as to what I can do to you or for you is a huge question. Sad to say, my supposed, master, has done some horrific things and more than likely tarnished the hubby name. The snake slithered away from the Anbu member and went to the tube containing the Jinchuriki. Inu watched in awe as the S used his tail to put in the password to release the green water. As soon as the liquid was out, Orenji opened the hatchet letting Naruto fall onto his back. He slithered towards the Anbu member and gave him the boy. He said, since you are here to catch and what not, I want you get Naruto out here and give him to the Hokage. The boy should not see his two san being taken away. Now go I need to clean up. Inu nodded as he carried Naruto in a fireman carry. As he started to go, Orenji said, Oh and by the way, you are going to have to throw that kanai a lot quicker to hit me. Inu decided not to say anything as the other two members joined him and left. Orenji sighed as he closed the door. He muttered to himself, I better play unconscious or Orochi might not believe me. With that the orange snake slithered to where the open tube was and turned over. Hitonus was enjoying himself. This parade with all of the yellow and black, representing Kumo, confetti coming down out of the buildings and with the shouting of his name almost made him feel bad for what he was going to do. Almost. He knew what the fate of those Hyugas was going to be. He didn't care so much as he only cared about was Kumo and its survival. So if it meant that one or two people had to suffer then so be it. He liked his lips as he saw the rakage hat on top of his head. The parade was ending as it was almost time for him to leave to Kumo. He smirked as he would have something to bring back with him. He said to the crowd of thousands of people and with the Hokage next to him, civilians of Kanahagakur no Sato, it has been an honor to be here with you to hopefully celebrate a bond between two of the most powerful villages of all time. Hopefully in the near future the will of fire and the heart of lightning will be fighting as one. I, as a representative of Kumogakur, am proud of what we were able to accomplish today embarking on a new future. Your hospitality knows no bounds as this parade shows me. This parade will go down in history of the day that my and now your brothers and sisters in Kumo will hold hands together as one. Thank you Konoha for this day. The crowd erupted as they shouted his name and Kumo's. Hiruzen clapped and showed outwardly happiness. Inside however was much different tune. No wonder Kumo sent this slime ass here. He has a tongue made of silver. You could tell that he was all bullshit but the way he talks makes him seem like he is the ing six paths. The faster he gets the hell out of Konoha the better before I start to smell controversy. The Hokage said, Citizens of Konoha it is time for our brother as he affectionately calls himself to leave for Kumohaker to agree to finalize and or ratify it. For this peace treaty to be finalized, he needs to go quickly. Let's give him a big Konoha send off. The crowd erupted again as the Anbu escorted the waving Hitonus to the gate. Hitonus smirked inwardly, it's almost time for my prize. It's almost too easy. In a moment Hitonus was in front of the gate with the Hokage and four Anbu in front of him. The Hokage asked, are you sure you want to go alone? It can be extremely dangerous. Hitonus waved his hands. He said, Hokage-sama, 
You and the whole fire country has given me such an amazing event with even better hospitality. I could not ask for much more. I want to wish you a great deal of prosperity and that one day the two flints can create not only lightning but also a fire. He bowed to the Hokage as he left. The Hokage also bowed at him. He thought as he saw Hedonis jump tree to tree, something is not right. I don't know what it is but it is bad. I can feel it. While Orochi was conversing with the adults and parents, his shadow clones were completing their mission. They were on top of the roof surveying the children. He noticed that the Hyuga princess was a tad bit drowsy. More like exhausted one clone thought as he remembered that was how Naruto was. He had to shake his head from those thoughts as it was will breaking. The clone transformed into an exact replica of Hanada. He said to the other clone, get the chloroform ready. When he saw the other clone pull out the rag, he set himself as he said, ready or not here I come. Three-year-olds play like two-year-olds but with more vocabulary. Right now Kiba, Choji, Shikamaru, Ino, and the birthday girl Hinata were playing tag. Her older cousin was designated to watch her. Basically all he had to do was tell Hiyashi Sama or Hime. As he watched them play he could not help but think about his cousin that was four years his senior. Neji hated how much cooler his cousin was. He knew that his cousin was the heir apparent of the Hyugas. He huffed as he knew that he could beat him. Dot one day. During his rant in his head Orochi was able to do the switcheroo on Hanada. Hanada looked around to see where she was. She saw a man come behind her only to have a rag over her mouth. Shish. It's okay Hanada-san. You will be asleep really soon. Soon enough the Hyuga princess was asleep. He snatched her up in a knapsack and started jumping building to building. He smirked as he said to himself, everything is going according to plan. Oh how wrong he was. Heen was outside in the luxurious backyard that was hosting his sister's birthday party. Today, Heen was able to get a day off because of the festivities. He smirked as he looked and act just like Hiyashi. He was considered the mini Hiyashi. He was definitely the apple of the Hyuga leader. He adjusted his brand new forehead protector. Today while he picked up his sister's birthday present he also picked up his new protector with the Hyuga symbol on the sides of the protector. He looked over to see his four-year cousin brood as the kids played tag. He liked Neji out of all of his brethren. He saw a spark in him that told him that he would be great. But if he didn't get over his jealousy, he would never be able to do anything. Because he would be the heir, he decided that he would brand Neji. Nope he wanted him to be his second in command. He walked over to his, future, second in command. He said, ah buck up Neji Kun. I mean you're acting like you're 13. Why don't we play tag with them? It looks like a lot of fun. Neji looked at the good natured boy with angry eyes. I want to train but I have to be guarding these kids. Neji pouted as Heen patted the boy on the head, much to Neji's disdain. Heen said, you're right that's why I'm here. I'll help you watch them because after all I am a super powerful ninja at the age of 8. Neji rolled his eyes as Heen reminded him, every day that he sees him. Neji grumbled, okay but you will help me to throw kanais. Heen laughed as he patted Neji's head. He replied, okay Neji-kun, I'll teach you. As they watched the kids play tag, Heen was showing Neji how to properly throw a kanai. Neji-kun, when you throw a kanai you do not want to throw it like a ball. You want it to be thrown as if it was an arrow coming out of a crossbow. The objective in each case is for the point to stick into the target with a sufficient amount of force. For this to be successful, accuracy, distance, number of rotations and placement of the body all must be taken into account. If the thrower uses a spin technique, the kanai will rotate during flight. This means that the thrower, assuming he is throwing the same way every time, must either choose a specific distance for each type of throw or, more practically, make slight adjustments to placement of the kanai in the hand as well as angle of release and rotation of the wrist. Variations in throw technique can allow great accuracy and range. Throwers may also need to adjust for throwing off center, around corners, and while running. Neji blinked at his cousin. He was considered a genius not only because of the power he contained but because of his mind. Neji grumbled. I'm only four and you expect me to know this. I barely know half of what those words mean. Heen smirked as he patted Neji's head. He whispered into his cousin's ear, you're not supposed to. 
That is why I'm going to show you. Neji brightened some but not too much as his cousin took him a few meters away from the kids. He said, now watch as I throw it. In an instant he threw the kanai. The kanai rotated slowly as it went into the wall. Neji's eyes were wide open. He was giddy as he thought this was easy especially how fluid and smooth Heen threw it. Heen said, okay Neji, your turn. Neji nodded as he to aim to a specific target. With all his might he threw a kanai. It whizzed through the air. It came towards its target. Kanais do not have a name for a target as it went straight towards, Hanada. Heen could only watch in horror as the blade came towards his running sister. Boom. Heen opened his eyes to see the kanai buried deep into the training dummy with, Hanada, in full deflection mode. It was as if she had been in a war. Heen's eyes went wide, as he thought, what the hell? That can't possibly be Hina Chan. He came over to his sister to check up on her as Neji on the ground crying his eyes out at the thought that he killed his little cousin. Heen asked her, Hey Hina, are you alright? You were awesome in deflecting that kanai. Let me check something. Hanada nodded as she watched Heen intently. Shit, I messed up. It's a reflection. What was I supposed to do? Hopefully he didn't think I'm a fake. As he was checking her body to see if anything was wrong, he slowly pulled out a kanai. Poof, Hanada, burst into smoke after Heen jabbed, her, Heen cursed loudly as he told Neji, Neji get to San, Hanada is gone, I'm going to find her and save her, Neji quickly ran to get Hiyashi as Heen activated the Byakugan, he was able to get her signature about 75 meters away, he had to hurry, with three kanais packed he was ready to go save his sister, Orochimaru finally go the memories of his dead clone and he was furious, why does everything fail because of children? He had everything packed into a scroll and it was almost time to leave. He excused himself from everyone and went to the bathroom. He simply had to go to someone's house. Someone named Haruno as he had a special parting gift for her. Heen raced towards the signature that had his sister with him or her. Don't worry Hina-chan, I'm coming to get you. As he rushed as fast as an eight-year could go. He was finally able to get close enough to the signature to see the transaction occur. The man was just outside of Konoha with another man. When he took a closer look, something sent chills up and down his spine. He saw his sister being traded from the hands of the hubby Sanin, Orochimaru, to the hands of the representative of Kumo, Hitonis. Shit, this is bad, real bad. Kami keep me safe as I'm about to take on a Jonin in a cage. This is for you Hina-chan. With that, he got closer. His heart started to beat faster as this could possibly be his last mission. He threw his kanai and hoped for the best. Orochimaru's clone was completing the transaction. He said, well Hitonis, I hope your plan works out well. You know after all, she isn't some nobody. She is the princess of the Hyuga clan and the only daughter of Hiyashi. There will be backlash but that is out of my hands. I washed my hands clean of this whole ideal. What Hedonis did not know was that the clone felt the boy's presence. He knew from the moment that he left that someone would be tracking him. He just didn't expect it to be an eight-year-old. This should be an interesting tale. A brother who would risk everything to get his sister back versus a man who would risk everything to save his village. Too bad I won't be able to see it. Once the it came into his mind, a kanai was darting towards him. He didn't move however as he wanted the smoke to figuratively and physically blow up in Hedona's face. The kanai hit him in the back. He blew up into a plume of smoke. What the hell is going on Orochimaru? Hitonis shouted as the smoke filled the perimeter. Because of the Byakugan activated, Heen was able to see where his sister was. He quickly raced into the smoke. The smoke cleared and the knapsack was gone. The Kumo ninja screamed as he was duped. He started to throw lightning strikes all over the place scorching the trees around him. His eyes were blood red, with veins popping out of from his neck all the way down to his toes. He shouted, where are you, Orochimaru? I'm going to kill you. Damn it, damn it, damn it. Heen although scared knew that he nor Hinata survive if they hid. He whispered in his sister's ear, Hina-chan, I need you be very quiet. Big brother is going to take care of you. He put her in a hollow tree trunk. He sighed as he was going to face this monster. As Hitonis fumed and threw lightning bolts. Soon he saw a shadowy figure come from behind a tree. 
The figure said, I'm no Orochimaru but I can still kick your ass. Hitonis saw red as he threw a lightning bolt at the boy. The boy used a Kwamiri to replace himself with a log courtesy of Hitonis. Looking for me I presume. Hitonis looked behind him to see a fist in his face. The fist sent him back a few steps. When he opened his eyes he saw a powerful kick coming towards his temple. Hitonis was able to recover and block the kick. He grabbed Heen's leg and spun him around. He threw him into a tree. Heen hit the ground with an, oof. Hitonis sneered, you little twerp. I'll make sure you will be nothing but ashes on the ground. Meet your maker you, Raiden. Denko no Bufu, lightning style, gale of lightning. He created an unstable ball of black, blue, and yellow energy. It crackled as it grew. Once it grew to the right size he threw at the panting almost unconscious Heen. The lightning gale came at him with increasing speed. Heen saw the bright light and quickly did a one more Kawarimi. This time however it was with the Kumo Jonan. The man was so caught off guard that he was hit full on blowing him into a tree. The electricity sent voltage coursing through his veins. The young Hyuga heir got into position to finish him off. He said, it's over you arrogant bastard. Hake Rokujuyan show, 8 trigram, 64 palms. 2 palms, 2 strikes in his right arm, 4 palms, 2 strikes in his left arm. 2 in his left shoulder, 8 palms, 2 in his right shoulder. 3 on his right thigh, and 3 on his legs, 16 palms, 3 on his left thigh. 3 on his legs, 1 on both of his knees, 2 on his left biceps, 2 on left triceps, and 2 on his left kidney 32 palms, 2 on the right biceps, 2 on the triceps, 4 more on the left biceps, 4 on the biceps, 2 on his right kidney, 6 at the ribs on the right, 6 at the ribs on the left side, 4 on the right pec, and 4 on the left pec, 64 palms. 4 on the clavicle, 5 on his right wrist, 5 on his left wrist. 10 on his on his left foot, 10 on the right foot, 3 on his right thumb, 2 on his right pointer finger, 3 on his right middle finger, 2 on his right, 2 on his right pinky finger, 3 on his left thumb, 2 on his left pointer, 3 on his left middle finger, 2 on his left ring finger, 2 on his left pinky finger, 2 at the sternum, 1 at liver, 1 at the pancreas, 1 at the head and 1 at the stomach. Hitonus was coughing up blood as his thoughts about be being beat by an 8 year. It did not bode well for him as he would be the latest laughing stock with Konoha and Kumo. By his pure will he was able to get up. He felt four possibly five chakra signatures. He knew that it was pointless in completing the mission but this boy will die. Heen was looking worse off. When he struck Hedonis the voltage went through his body. It was like barbed wire that ripped his skin and chakra off. He panted as his chakra level was low because of the voltage being siphoned. He knew he didn't have too much time left. He said as he coughed up blood, how are you still standing? You should be finished by now. The man chuckled as the others dropped down in front of them. The five he saw were Hiyashi Hayuga, Hazashi Hayuga, Harini Hayuga, Ko Hayuga and Hoado Hayuga. He noticed that their bodies were weak and barely responsive. He said, it's nice to see all you are here. I know I'm going to die but I'm taking one of you with me. Before anyone could move Hedonis said, Raiden, Shirai, lightning release, lightning strike. Instead of pointing his lightning strike at Heen, he pointed it at the tree that contained Hinata. No one could move as the paralysis that was added along with the concoction was still in effect. Hedonis fell down dead. It happened in slow motion. Heen ran towards his sister. He was slowly losing consciousness as he ran. He knew this was it his last chance to save his sister. I'm sorry Hina-chan, I'm sorry that I won't be able to see you grow up. You might remember me but I want you to know I love you sis and be the best you Hyuga leader you can be. In a moment before the lightning strike the tree, Heen committed the ultimate sacrifice by doing one last Kawarimi. Boom, Heen fell down to the ground. The lightning strike went right through his heart, rupturing it completely. His chakra was severed as it cut each chakra flow from the Tenkutsu point. His death was instant but his sacrifice will live on as Hinata was safe and sound in front of Hiyashi. No, Heen Kun, my Sochi is gone, my Sochi is gone. Harini fell to the ground as she screamed her lungs out over the death of her son. She started to feel the baby's pain. Hiyashi couldn't move, his body felt numb as he saw his wife and daughter cry, 
and his son, his only son, on the floor dead. Only one tear fell down his cheek. The old arrogant Hiyashi had also died that day. There is only one Hiyashi now, Hiyashi the Stoic. Hiruzen was back into the Hokage Tower. To be quite honest, he had a sense of foreboding. As he sighed and lit his pipe, he heard and saw a crack appear on his pipe. This is not good, not good at all. Hokage-sama, we have a problem. Hiruzen looked at the panting Inu rushing through the door. He straightened himself up as he listened intently to the man. His eyes told Inu he better start talking. Hokage-sama, Orochimaru was in fact the one experimenting in those illegal labs. Hiruzen was thinking a mile a minute. He said, what proof do you have of such a claim? If we are going to bust him, I need proof. Instantly we documents in manila folders were on his desk. He glanced through each file as the sickness in his stomach grew with each passing second. Inu said with a grim voice, Hokage-sama, it seems like he also experimented on Naruto Uzumaki. This made the Sandame Hokage to look up at the Anbu member. He could not believe it. How could this monster do this under his nose? He slammed his fists on the desk breaking it. He started to breathe hard as he spoke. Inu, where is Naruto? Inu replied quickly, he is in the hospital with Neko and Karasu watching him. Hiruzen nodded as he said with anger flowing through him, that son of a, of a father is going to pay. We're going to make rounds. Is there anything else you need to tell me? Inu nodded as he said, Hokage-sama, we also found an operation he created. This operation is to kidnap the Hyuga Prin. Before he could finish, another Anbu went through the window. Hokage-sama, the representative of Kumo is dead. The Hokage got up with authority. He said, what the hell happened? The Anbu explained everything caused such great pain into his chest. With a steel resolve, he said, Inu, round up all available Anbu. We are about to catch a snake. It took a few minutes to gather five Anbu squads. Hiruzen spread them out around the perimeter of the house. He picked three Anbu members including Inu to come in with him. They were ready. Saya Haruno had a bad feeling. She had the day off for she could be with her daughter, Sakura Haruno. She had been slightly neglectful to her daughter. It wasn't because she hated her daughter or anything like that. It was simply because being an Anbu commander was keeping her away almost 20 hours per day. She sighed as she sat on the chair in the living room and was doing a puzzle with Sakura. She looked at the picture of her and her late husband. She wanted to be a housewife where she could be with Sakura every day while her husband worked. Her husband was an ex-Jonin who became famous for his amazing banking skills. He was one of the reasons that Konoha had one of if not the biggest financial surplus in the world. His interconnections with the other businesses strengthened the shinobis and civilians. He made some union agreements that stopped a civil war in Konoha. Oh how she missed him. He was killed in the Kyubi attack when he saved some of the merchants from the fires. He was killed when a blazing support beam fell on his back. The blazes were too strong for any of the merchants to save him. She shook her head as a tear went down her face and hit a piece of the puzzle. Sakura looked up at her mother. She had an inquisitive look on her small face as she said, Ka-san, why are you crying? Saya chuckled as she wiped her eyes. Sakura ed her head to the side as her mother started to speak, I'm not crying honey. I just had some sweat coming down. Sakura asked, Ka-san does sweat come out of your eyes? Saya laughed as she rubbed the top of Sakura's head. Oh how she love her smart daughter. She saw a shadow land on her cherry blossom tree in front of her house. In a moment her eyes went stone cold before going soft. She said, Sakura-chan, I want you to go to your room. I'll be up there to play a game with you. Sakura frowned slightly. She nodded as she ran upstairs. Okay Ka-san. When Sakura left, the shadow promptly came in front of Saya. Saya's eyes became hard and cold. It was almost like steel. She said as the Anbu member fell to one knee, Saru, you know and I know that I do not like to bring work home, especially when I finally have a chance to be with my daughter for a full day for the first time in 18 months. So this better be ing important. Saru nodded as he spoke, I know Saya Sama and I am so sorry to interrupt your time with your beautiful daughter. This is really important. Your suspicions were correct. Orochimaru was the owner of the illegal labs. There is more he is the accomplice to the failed attempt of kidnapping of the Hyuga princess. There is more, 
It seems like Orochimaru experimented on the Kyubi Jinchuriki. Saya's eyes went wide at this. She could believe that she was right about Orochimaru was the owner. After all he was a scientist who had privileges so he would be a prime target. But with what happened with the Hyuga princess caught her in a loop. What shocked her the most was the fact that he experimented on Naruto. There were no visible signs of abuse or anything. She said, this is bad. I see that you probably told the Hokage or the Hokage knows. I have two questions for you. What did he say that he wanted done? The second is how was Hitonis able to even get that close to the Hyuga princess? The Hyugas have the best security system with their Byakugan. Well I could answer that, you little wench. Saru was not quick enough to move when Akanai sliced his neck. Blood started to spurt out as he fell to the ground. Saya looked in horror as the very last person she wanted to was standing in front of her, Orochimaru. He had a wide smirk on his face as he twirled the kanai in his hand. He said, Well Haruno-san, it is a lovely day isn't it? I mean you have the day off to spend time with your precious daughter but here we are with dead body on the floor and an innocent kid upstairs. How things can turn so quickly. She growled as he continued to speak, Well Haruno-san, we both know you move you die and you kid will be dead at best. Now you wanted to know how was anyone able to crack the guarded treasure chest also known as the princess. Well what would one say if one spiked the drinks? Ah it's easy when you were at a birthday party you voluntarily didn't go to. You should know at the party, I was going to let you be reacquainted with your husband. Pity. She growled as she slightly moved her hand to press the button. She slowly got up as she spoke in a calm voice. You know Orochimaru, you think that you can come to my house, my home and threaten my family. I'll be damned to let you live. She threw a kanai at the hubby Sanin. He easily deflected it only to be acquainted with her red fist. Orochimaru was sent back only to feel someone behind him. Saya did a spin kick into his back only to him disappear. Orochimaru landed behind her and kicked her into a wall. Orochi smirked as he taunted her, I guess it is true. The harder a girl hits a boy the more she loves him. She growled as she took her pink sword out of the sheath that hung on the wall. She got into a defensive position as she spoke, Oh yeah Orochimaru, I'm absolutely crazy almost stalker type about you. Get over yourself. Orochi pulled a kanai out and got into an offensive stance. He rushed to her at great speed as his kanai and her pink sword collided. He said, I am over myself but I want to be under you. Orochimaru was trying to push her into a wall. She sneered as she pushed the man back with her brute strength. Orochimaru was having a hard time pushing her back as her blade was sharper than anything he has ever seen. She was cutting the kanai clean through. He knew he had to end this quickly. He used his tongue to pull out a small canister out of his pocket. Her eyes went wide at this and kicked him in the solar plex. This only helped him as he released the smoke screen. She coughed and closed her eyes. She started to swing her sword literally cutting the air. She screamed, Where are you Orochimaru? Show yourself, you sniveling snake. It did not help her as he disappeared into thin crisp air. Or so she thought. Looking for me beautiful, Orochimaru whispered into her ear. Her eyes went wide as Orochi held onto her. He said as she struggled to break free, I told you from the beginning, if you moved, you died. Well my dear the game is over. Her eyes went wide as she felt Orochimaru sink his elongated canine teeth. She screamed as she tried and struggled to get Orochimaru off. She tried to fight, she really did. Saya felt her body starting to go weak. The feelings in her arms and legs started to go. She had only one thought, I got to fight for Sakura. I can't let her be without a father and a mother. I've got to fight. She poured chakra into her blade used the last of her strength to do a reversal and slashed the hubby Sanin with her pink blade. Orochimaru was sent back to a wall with a thud. He had a huge slash mark over his chest. His eyes were wide in horror as he saw his blood on her blade. The sword was a special weapon that has been with the Haruno family for years. If a Haruno poured their chakra into the weapon and got the blood of their opponent, the opponent could not kill that person or anyone in their family. It only works once per person. Once that Haruno dies the curse would also die as well. As she was slipping from consciousness and bleeding from her mouth, she chuckled. She said with her last breath, I beat the game, Orochimaru.
Orochimaru screamed as he once again was tricked by this Haruno. He had to hurry and get out of here. He looked over to see Saru's dead body and smirked. How useful you are dead, Saru. Orochimaru said as he took Saru's armor. He thought, this might not be a bad thing after all. I'm going to get away with murder. Literally. After he was fully garbed in Saru's armor, he saw shadows going to his house. This should be interesting. Orochimaru was cornered. Yes, the hubby Sanin was cornered by Sandame Hokage and three Anbu members. Hokage's face was that of rage as he put the bow staff at the hubby Sanin's neck. Orochimaru, you are under arrest for treason against Kanahagakur no Sato, the attempted kidnap and murder of Hin Hayuga, the murder of Hiriko Yamanaka, the attempted kidnapping of Hinata Hayuga, an accessory to the murder of Hazashi Hayuga and the experimentation of Naruto Uzumaki. Orochimaru chuckled at this. My, my Serutobi sensei it is great to see you. I mean you barely come around to visit anymore. But now you bring not one, not two but five different Anbu squads. I must have done some very bad. But I've done something worse. I know that I won't be forgiven for what happened to Naruto but I have long since condemned myself. I must ask sensei. How does it feel to know that if you had paid an ounce of attention to the boy this could have been prevented? Hiruzen growled as pushed the boy closer onto his neck. Orochimaru was very calm that scared the Hokage. He continued with a hiss, S. Serutobi sensei, your plans to make me pay are a little late. I've been gone for over an hour. After all you taught me how can I hit something that is not even there? Before the Hokage could move Orochimaru disappeared into smoke. Son of a, he was never here. All right we got go find him. The Hokage said with authority. And Anbu barraged into the house. Hiruzen said, Saru, you better have a magical ing reason to be here. I'm in no mood to play around. So you better start talking or you will be my next target. Saru nodded as he spoke. Hokage-sama, my squad was able to find the presence of Orochimaru. Form what they told me he was spotted southeast going toward Iron Country. I'm going to go assist them and bring him into justice. Hiruzen sighed in relief. They were going to get this bastard once and for all. He took a seat into one of the chairs in Orochimaru's house. He said, Okay Saru pursued him with caution. Inu you are the overall leader of this operation. You are to gather everything here and document it. I want everything deeply searched. I do not want a single thing overlooked. Do you understand me? Inu nodded as he saw his leader leave towards the tower. Hiruzen finally reached the tower again. The mental strain has definitely put more wrinkles on his old face. He didn't what else could go wrong but had a feeling it was not the end. He took a puff of his pipe, as he thought about the backlash of today's events. Damn, how could we let Orochimaru waltz out of here without even noticing? He couldn't have gotten that far without so much as a, hello Orochimaru, or a, how is Naruto-kun doing today? For that matter, why didn't I see what was going with Naruto-kun quick enough? The boy has suffered enough and I just watched with obliviousness. The son of A is a great manipulator. I'll give him that. I honestly don't know how he got out. We were on lockdown. Someone better tell me something. At that moment an Anbu member appeared. He went on one knee as he spoke in a grim tone. Hokage-sama, we have discovered how Orochimaru left. This made the Hokage listen more intently as this had been boggling his mind for the past three hours. He was able to get away because you unintentionally allowed him to. Sir we found Anbu commander Haruno unconscious and severely damaged and Anbu captain Saru dead at the Haruno's residence. Hiruzen's eyes went wide, if one were to look closely they could see more wrinkles come onto his face as a tear fell down. No, my son can't be dead. No, not like this. How many more people have to die because of this? How am I going to tell my daughter-in-law, my very pregnant daughter-in-law? I can't lose another son. This is going to be stopped right now. Hiruzen said, Ryu, get the Shinobi Council here now. This is an emergency meeting. I expect him to be here in two minutes. Go. Ryu nodded and disappeared leaving the Hokage to weep for his oldest son. It took all about a minute for everyone to be seated. Serutobi did not like what he saw as the members of the shinobi council were still drugged. He frowned as he spoke, good afternoon council. I am seriously disappointed with everything that happened on this day. I'm going to brief you on everything that has happened. First and foremost, 
our defenses have been compromised. With that in mind, we have lost one of our genin prospects in Hinhayuga. I know that people die every day, but how the was he able to leave the gates without anyone checking him? I don't damn who you are, you must be checked by a guarding shinobi. I can only blame mainly the Uchiha for this. That sobered Fugaku right up. He exclaimed, Hokage-sama, how is our fault for this? He was already angry for having to be here. Now he was downright furious. However the look the Hokages gave him told him he didn't give a shit. Hiruzen said calmly, yes Fugaku I blame this on the Uchiha. If the Uchiha did their jobs then he would not have gotten out of Konoha's walls. In addition if one of you would have cared to look into Orochimaru's bag just maybe you would have noticed a human being in the bag. Explain that then I'll say you're innocent. However I have more important things to address. Now I've decided to beef up the defenses. Because of the fact that the Hayuga and the Uchiha have not done its job correctly by protecting Konoha, soon you will deploy ten members of your clan with each man or woman having three dogs effectively tomorrow. Hokage-sama, this is outrageous. We were promised to have control of the police and patrol force. Fugaku raged. This ongoing problem has been going on since the Kayubi attack when Hiruzen added the Hayuga to the patrol. To add to this Hiruzen put the Hayuga's brother as the second commander. Hiruzen looked at the Uchiha leader with cold as steel eyes. He had enough of the Uchiha bringing up what his predecessor, Toborama said and did. He was the Hokage and he wasn't going to be bossed around by the descendant of Azumo Uchiha and a dead guy. He said, yes Fugaku, I know what you were promised. But have you ever thought that if you kept your promise and actually kept Konoha safe, then we will keep our part. A promise is a two-way street. Now I'm tired of you keep bringing this up. Let me explain something to you Uchiha. I am Hiruzen Serutobi and I am the current Hokage. I am not Toborama who made that promise to you. I have in kept my sensei's wishes. I have kept it because of the respect of my sensei. If you bring it one more time we will see what police force you will be running. So just be quiet and do your job. If you have a problem with it, then you can leave right now. I do not have time to hear you whining. Do you understand? Fugaku was bleeding from his palms as he squeezed his hand into a ball. He had to control himself from leaping over and killing the Hokage. He knew he had to keep a tight lip for now. Soon I'll make sure you are six feet under. Fugaku replied, I apologize for my actions, Hokage-sama. I will learn to speak in place. Hiruzen looked at him with a glare. He said, don't let it happen again. Now to continue the meeting, Orochimaru has created a huge mess. He has been charged with the murder of my son also known Anbu Captain Saru, severely injured Anbu Commander Saya Haruno, attempted the kidnapping of Hinata Hayuga, the accomplice of the murder of Hime, the supposed experimenting on Yamanaka and the definite experimenting of Naruto Uzumaki. They were shocked by the charges against the hubby Sanin. The last one hit hard for most of them. Naruto had been around their kids. He played with them, ate with them, he was part of some of their families. To hear that he had been experimented on is disturbing to say the least. There were no scars or any indication of it. Hiruzen continued, from your faces I see the last one hit hard. Yes, Naruto-kun has been experimented on. The problem is we don't know what he did to Naruto. This has brought some rules and guidelines that will be dealt with when it comes to Naruto-kun. This guidelines are to be enforced immediately. The first is to ensure that no one else uses him for their own personal gain. No one and I mean no one shall adopt Naruto. There was verbal outrage from everyone except Fugaku. Fugaku just really wanted the boy dead. When he becomes Hokage the boy would be a tool that would be under the Sharingan's control. He inwardly smiled as he thought about his rule. Hiruzen said after everyone calmed down, I know how tough this is but it had to be done. The second is that since we do not how much Orochimaru has done, we must assume Naruto is a sleeper cell that is hell-bent on destroying Konoha. In this case, we are going to seal his memories and try to wipe them clear. Inoichi, after this meeting we are going to seal them. The council is a collective group side. Hiruzen said, the final guideline is that he will not know about Orochimaru. The Hokage sent for Inoichi to come to Naruto's hospital bed. It was not the first time that Hiruzen requested that Inoichi to help with a patient in the hospital. The tall man was confused as to why he was here. Hokage-sama, what is the point of me being here? 
I mean I could be drawing information from Hitona's brain before it dies. The Hokage looked tired. The job was getting to him as more dire events keep occurring. He said, Inoichi, he is a bomb waiting to explode. He has just lost his father and we don't know what Orochimaru had taught him. What I need you to do is seal his memories once and for all. Orochimaru had finally made it to the secret Akatsuki base. He sighed as he kept a picture of Naruto in his pocket right next to Ophelia. He did the hand sign that opened this cave like. This is interesting. In this PL lace was a huge statue. The statue is a giant, humanoid entity with only its upper torso and arms visible. Its back has a number of spike-like protrusions. The statue is blindfolded. As he looked on a being appeared behind him. Orochimaru could not see his face but felt his aura. The man smirked as he spoke. Welcome Orochimaru, it is great that you have made it here. Orosamaru replied, it is great to be here. Is there anything you want me to do right now leader Sama? The man walked past him as he walked to the statue and touched it. Once he touched it nine spiritual beings that took the shape of dragons circled the man. In a moment the dragon circled his hands. In an instant, Tihi crushed them causing a purple light to glow in his hand. Orochimaru watched in fascination as the man opened his hand. In his hand was a ring with a purple gem with the kanji, viper, on it. The man said, Orochimaru, you were asked to join because of your mind and ninjutsu talents. Your responsibility is to make us better using science and chakra. You will be called on to capture a Jinchuriki. You should know one more thing. Orochi was puzzled at this but complied, what is leader Sama? The leader smirked as the ring glided itself to Orochi's ring hand. He said with a certain satisfaction, Orochimaru, you are not the only Sanin to have joined our ranks. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.